It's Friday the 13th, and some lady on the phone talking about a problem with my bank account said it'll be a full moon tonight too. What a welcome surprise. So for this special occasion I had no idea about until five minutes ago, I've put together 23 single stories for a big compilation. The first half are allegedly true scary stories, and the second half are some creepypasta. I'll let you know when we get to that point. Also, this full five-hour episode is free to download. Just click the link in the description anytime you like, and you can listen to this sucker anytime, anywhere, anyhow you want. All I ask is you click the like button and share this video somewhere to help me spread the good creepy news of scary stories. Now, enjoy this Friday the 13th on me. A subscriber sent me a chilling first-hand account of their encounter with something they believe was a real-life Wendigo. Growing up on a small, mostly self-sustained chicken farm, my family had many animals. We would have anywhere from 50 to 200 chickens on the farm, our Alaskan Malamute, a barn cat, and a few other more exotic animals as well. Mostly birds, skunks, or young foxes that I would find in the woods and bring home to nurse back to health. My childhood was full of animals, and considering the chickens would be slaughtered about every two or three years for meat and sell, I was used to seeing death at a young age. A few times our Malamute got loose, and he would attack many of the chickens. Or that's what we thought. I never actually saw him go at more than one single chicken. The most I saw was the roosters, who we raised for the county fair shows, taunting him, walking into his chained area and pecking him in the face, and running just out of his reach. Honestly, I never blamed the big guy for defending himself when he could. But on three occasions, I'd come home from school to see my father piling dead chickens on top of one another, loads of them. And none of them had been attacked in quite the same way that the Malamute did. He would simply snap the neck, but whatever was doing this to the chickens, it left quite the gruesome scene. The animals sometimes tore almost in two. Not to mention the different breeds were taken care of in different ways. The white-laying hens, who were rather plump and rarely came off their nests, would be missing their heads. The thinner, long-legged Polish, the chickens with the fluffy-looking feathers on their hats, were often nearly completely plucked of their silky plumes. These ones specifically were rarely ever eviscerated, while the rest were. I often helped pick up the dead birds, we slaughtered many for ourselves, and this didn't bother me too much. I never questioned as a young child why our dog would take so many birds like that. As a farm kid, I was told that wolves were bad, and because Malamutes tend to have a large percentage of wolf genetics, it was just his animal DNA kicking in at times. But I didn't believe that, and I could tell that my parents were grasping at straws. It was only in high school while doing reports for the science teacher. He would have us track various animal sightings throughout the state, and one of them was for deer. I learned a lot of seemingly useless information about deer that month. Their lifespans, mating patterns, size, weight, diet, the whole kebab. But this was when I began to notice that some pieces of the puzzle began to fall together. Almost every time our chickens were unceremoniously slaughtered, was just before hunting season. A few weeks afterward, my father would come home boasting that he saw a large deer out in the woods. He boasted that one day, he would have that sucker mounted in the house. I knew exactly what deer he was talking about, one that we nicknamed Oscar. When you've been hearing talk of that large deer in the woods for almost 15 years, and you know that white-tailed deer live for about four and a half years, you begin to get a little skeptical. Anyway, my first encounter with an animal that I actually feared, I was with my childhood best friend. We were about nine years old, and I wanted to show off the property I'd grown up on. My father had large deep trails wide enough for his tractor throughout the woods. It was a large square 30-acre lot. We had a path following the perimeter of the property, 
and another crisscrossing the square in half from both directions. There were many other trails as well. Those pine woods were alive with life, and I'd often followed game trails sometimes nearly 50 acres into the neighbor's property. We walked up behind the barn on the north side of the property, following the main trail to the back of what we owned. I'd read a book which was published on the farm about 20 years before my own family moved in. I was telling her about the property and the previous owners. The two of us were nerds, and this kind of information was our bread and butter. Now, usually, I cut the walk in half, walking through one of the crisscrossed sections because, frankly, I'm lazy. But I'm also very proud of my home. I had a slew of new information, so we kept walking on this occasion. The sun was getting farther behind us. We had gotten off the school bus about half an hour before, so we were pretty far in. Now, I've encountered this Oscar before, and knowing this, my mother had warned us not to walk too far into the woods. It was rut season, and the bucks may get territorial. Obviously, we didn't listen. Turning with the square-shaped paths, we began to walk south. That's when I spotted one of my favorite game trails. I ushered my friend towards it. I was walking just in front of her then, and she bumped into me. I'd gone quiet for the first time in close to an hour, because I spotted it. A massive deer standing before us. My friend steps out from behind me, confused, then gazes past me at the deer as well. We're both awestruck, silent. We're taking in every detail. The deer was on the main trail. The game trail we followed cut off the southeast corner of the property. But this image of the deer that was before us, it wasn't right. Imagine a deer... Copy and paste it into a document and scale it up three times its original size. The antlers alone could be either side of the trees blocking us from the creature. I remember the dull thud they made when it bumped them against the trees, as of telling us, you're lucky the trees are in the way. We stood entirely still before we began running. And I'm ashamed to admit that I felt a need to outrun my best friend. Something primal in me, I guess. We made it back, winded, exhausted, and terrified, but also excited to see a deer so big. We told my parents we'd seen Oscar the deer, not once imagining the possible outcome to our fate. Maybe it was our childish mind seeing what looked like a deer, but I was soon beginning to believe that Oscar was something else. About a week after this, my father took me hunting. Up I go into a tree stand, holding onto a thick pine, much like the one Oscar had tapped with his horns. This day was cold and foggy. It was a school day, but I was allowed to stay home, and it was also the only year I'd ever go hunting. As I sat in that stand mostly trying not to fall asleep. I began to turn to look around, eventually scoping out the back side of the tree. Some distance behind me across the path, I saw a large deer. I was excited, ready to tell my father that I spotted something, but I quickly fell quiet. The deer had looked up at me, looked directly at me even from that distance, even with the fog, I felt like I was staring point blank into its face as well. But the typical glossy black eyes of a deer were not the eyes that I met, and I was soon wishing to go back home. I started to complain to my father. I made up every excuse to go home and escape, and finally he relented. On one condition, I was to go walk with him up toward the southeast side to look for deer on foot. The sky seemed to crack apart as we descended the ladder. Rain was falling now through the trees around us, the fog mostly dissipating in the warm shower. I went eastward while he went south of our position. I ended up nearly at the top of the hill, the one I don't like to go near due to my fear of heights. There was a thicket bush there. It was partly stamped down already and curious. I poked my head inside and found a young fawn. It was maybe a few days old. 
I didn't want to disturb it in fear of its mother maybe abandoning it, so I rose up, and as I did, I found myself staring directly at a doe, its mother. She was snorting and stomping in agitation, and instead of charging or trying to push me away, she instead stopped. Her ears went on high alert, then she simply crawled into the thicket, hiding with her fawn. Then I heard the sound of a branch snapping, a branch, not a stick on the ground. It sounded like it had come from somewhere behind me. I walked forward slowly. I could see my father's fluorescent orange cap in the distance. I was stiff as a board when I finally got near him. These woods were beginning to turn sinister. Thankfully, my father was giving up on the day because of the rain and didn't ask me any questions. Apparently, he assumed I was just cold, and that's why I was shaking like a leaf. Later that day, after returning home, my father would come back home after going out again, saying that he saw Oscar walking across the street toward the nearby river. Only at that section, it was more like a sandy creek. That was behind our neighbor's house, and oddly enough, to make things worse, the sweet older widow who lived there that I often visited with to bird watch turned up dead of a heart attack later that same week. Right after her passing, all the sightings of Oscar the deer had died down for nearly 10 more years. Within that time, I began to forget about the weird happenings in the forest and on our property. I had made a friend from across the world who I would video chat with often. And using my phone, I decided one day I'd take a walk with my dog so that I could record the property for her. As I left the house, I went out the back door to show off the large open lawn. I walk across the path, which cuts into the middle of the woods, and I go deeper. As I get near the back end, my dog begins to walk closer to me. I keep going in, despite my dog obviously getting a bit scared which was completely unlike him. Soon, it began to rain, so I decided to turn back toward the house. I didn't want my new phone to get wet. It was my only source of communication with my new foreign friend. I begin to slow down about halfway back, and that's when I begin to hear branches breaking behind me. I turn just so I can show my friend what the sound was. I turn the camera back to the trail and there's a small oak tree fallen on the path about 50 yards in front of me. A tree that had not been lying there before. Nor did I hear it fall and make a sound. Again, all I had heard were branches snapping. So this was quite strange. I look at my dog, who was happily panting now, probably excited to get back home. With that, I decide I'm just being paranoid. I continue to walk back when I suddenly hear a high-pitched, pitiful screech from the direction of our home. If you've ever heard a rabbit scream, it's horrifying. At first, I didn't know what it was and I began to run towards it. As I get to the house, I find my rabbit dead. He's still warm though, but there are no footprints in the soft earth, though there should have been. Every part of me was screaming not to stay outside so I grabbed my perished friend, and I took him inside, only to get him a fleece blanket to wrap him in. I bury him, but I made sure to keep my dog inside while I did. When I was done, I stood up tall. I was on the edge of the woods near the base of our large evergreen pine tree. My eyes were locked in the trees nearby. I then threw the shovel to the ground and shouted at the top of my lungs, that this was my home, and whatever was doing this was not welcome. At that point in time, the farm was running low on chickens. All that was really left was a Muscovy duck who was nearly seven years old. I can say honestly, he's still alive somehow. My parents were forced to join the workforce, so it was quieter around here anymore. More sad. I grabbed the shovel and turned, from this view of the farm, the barn is to my right. There is a large red shed in front of me, just off to the right as well. A white shed blocks out most of the view of the red one, and the house is to my left. The road was in my sight, 
and many trees were sheltered in the large yard toward the west side. Standing in the road, hidden partially by some tree branches, I saw a deer who was the same size and even the same shape as Oscar. It was facing towards me, watching me. I held my ground, still angry at what it did to my rabbit. It must have lost interest because it looked away from me and it began to cross the road. But as it did, I finally got a good look at the thing. The creature was massive, but its body was torn, bone showing, and its head was more skull than flesh. I forgot to breathe as I looked at it. When it was gone out of sight, I struggled to breathe again. I went inside, not even feeling safe in my own home. The next day, I would take my dog for a walk, trying to calm down. I was approaching the river that ran parallel to the road, and as I did, the dog began to freak out. I looked up, and down the hill from us, there it stood, knee-deep in the river. I didn't react out of fear. My dog couldn't either. I scooped him up, all 20 pounds of him, and I began to quietly walk back the way we came. By the time I get over a large hill in the road, he calms down, and I'm able to set him down again. I wonder to myself why that thing keeps crossing the road, why it keeps letting itself be seen, but often just barely. I haven't seen it in some time, and I moved out after a while. Maybe it's waiting, maybe it's done with our land, because everything there is dead. I don't know, but that creature made our property a living hell. Skinwalker in Sika Hollow by Native Legends I am 21 years old and legally blind. I also live in the northeast corner of South Dakota on a reservation. I am of Sioux heritage, and I grew up with all the stories of my people. This particular story that I experienced took place when I was 21. In fact, it was on my 21st birthday. The day started like any other. My brother, his girlfriend, and a couple of our friends went to Fargo, North Dakota to go to the mall. We had spent a couple of hours there and were now ready to make our way back. My brother decided to give me one of my birthday gifts. Then we stopped at one last store and bought something. We headed back to our town and made a quick stop at our Jesus Tree Dealer's house, if you know what I mean. Once we packed back into the car, we were arguing about where to go smoke when I blurted out Sika Hollow, which actually translates to bad ground. I, my brother, and two of our friends agreed, but my brother's girlfriend was saying no. Despite her protest, we went anyway. As we headed out to Sika Hollow, a car began following us. We were starting to get worried. My brother didn't have a driver's license, and we had an ounce in the car, so we weren't sure if this was a cop or not. Yet the faster we went, the faster the car was going. When we pulled into the parking lot of the hollow, my brother's girl said that her sister was following us, so we all finally felt relieved. We started walking along the trails of the hollow, these trails go all over the place. As we were walking and talking, I think I was the only one who noticed that there was a sound of branches snapping and footsteps on the hill next to us. It sounded like another person, but not part of our group. I looked around, wondering why someone was up there in the brush. It was at that time that I realized that I forgot my glasses in the car. I may be legally blind, but it doesn't mean I can't see, it just means I probably shouldn't be driving. 
In that brief moment of realizing my glasses were gone and that someone was out there with us in the woods, I looked back up and saw that my friends were gone. I remember thinking, what the heck? Why did they leave me like that? Suddenly, I heard a thud like someone jumping onto the ground. I quickly turned around and already knew that someone was behind me. I saw the silhouette and asked, what's up, cousin? Not entirely sure who it was, but my greeting was met with an unholy scream. Goosebumps flooded over my body. I began to feel beads of sweat forming on my skin. This was no person on the trail with me. This was something else entirely, and at that moment, I think I knew what it was. That's why I pulled out a cigarette, unused, and ripped the tobacco from it, sprinkling it on the ground in front of me. I knew to do this from the stories I'd been told when I was younger. What do you want with me, spirit? I managed to say with a stutter. You have no reason to be here. It took a few steps closer to me. I could hear sickening popping sounds coming from its mouth and limbs as if the thing's body was imperfect and constantly morphing. Then, in a voice that was almost like my grandma's, it spoke to me. It spoke to me with human words. Go home. The most disturbing part about hearing that was the fact that my grandma had been dead for years. There's something sickening about hearing a voice that makes you warm inside and nostalgic used by something evil. I panic. I fumbled and turned around, running right into my brother. Whoa, man, he said to me. I looked back in the direction where that thing had been. The two of us were alone now. Whatever had been on the trail with me had disappeared. We met back up with the others, and before I could explain to them what had happened to me, we all heard this god-awful scream. We began to hike back down to the car, no longer wanting to smoke. There was just something wrong, terribly wrong, about that place. But when we get back to the car, I guess the group was mostly feeling safe. We decide to roll down the windows and smoke a bit right there, passing around a bottle of liquor. I didn't feel very good about the situation, so I didn't participate. After an hour or so, it was beginning to get dark. Suddenly, one of my friends begins freaking out in her seat. What is that? She screams, pointing to a trail we had come from earlier. There it was. I could see it more clearly now with my glasses on, even though it was darker out. An all too thin, not entirely human looking thing, covered in fur. I was moments away from screaming when the creature went down on all fours and in a sickening insect-like motion, crawled right up against the car. It happened so fast, it was almost like it teleported from the head of the trail to right outside the car doors. Then we all were able to scream. We burned rubber down the road, heading home. All the while, that thing is chasing the back of the car, screaming like someone in pain. When I made it back home, I burned sage around the house, hoping that the spirit we angered would not follow us there. The Sioux have many disturbing legends, and quite often, these legends become reality. And for those of you who do believe, never think that you'll smell the rotting meat smell first, or that the woods will go silent before you see a skinwalker. There are many different ways to encounter one, and sometimes there will be no warning. The Island in the Lake From Names James 0933 Rachel, my fiancé, and I were on hour 17 into our drive to her family's cabin in northern Minnesota for a small vacation. I glanced at her with heavy eyelids, to see that she was fast asleep in the passenger seat. 
The last two hours of the trip were spent through desolate back roads in towns that consisted of a hundred people and a lone stoplight. I could feel myself immersing into the solitude as the roads began to be labeled by numbers instead of names. Finally, I turned onto the long stretch of road that winded through the forest and led to our destination, the cabin. Siri let me know there was two miles left. Then everything went back to silence. The car slowly trudged over the underdeveloped road as large chunks of gravel crunched and tumbled beneath the wheels, while towering pine trees loomed above us, blocking out any stars. We arrived, and I was so exhausted that I considered just sleeping right there in the driveway. I'd never been to this cabin before, but upon first glance, it was quite cozy. It's not one of those decked out cabins that rich people buy, but it had three bedrooms and set just offshore to a small 1100 acre lake. We quickly unloaded everything and collapsed onto a bed that smelled older than time. Though we were completely beat, we were excited to spend some time away from it all. The sun lit up our room early the next morning and I was filled with a huge sense of relief when, out of routine, I checked my phone to see that there was no service. Nobody could bother us, even if they tried. Rachel offered to drive to the nearest town to get some groceries, so I could settle in and check out the cabin myself. I rifled through hundreds of dusty books that sat on the shelves in the living room. Then I pulled out a dozen board games as I excitedly planned out our time ahead. I made my way outside and onto the dock that stretched out into the lake. A small boat lightly rocked in the water, and the dock creaked and groaned underneath my feet. I stared out at the lake, and finally felt the last of my anxiety dissipate. As the drive to town was around half an hour, I figured I would set out on the lake to do some fishing. A small island caught my eye that sat close to the middle of the water. It was maybe a hundred yards in diameter, and was filled with dense trees and shrubs. Something about it drew me toward it. I can't really describe it, but it's like it slowly sucked me in. The island had an almost eerie glow about it, like it wasn't really in the same world as ours. I anchored maybe 50 feet from the shore and started casting. It wasn't 30 seconds after that I felt something hit my boat. I had nearly had whatever was on the line up to the boat. It must have gotten off the hook, I thought hit the boat before swimming away. When I reached out to reapply the bait, I saw a fish dangling off the end of the line still. An uneasy feeling washed over me when I saw that it was completely mangled. It was nearly ripped in half with tears all along what was left of its body. My first thought was that a bigger fish must have jumped on it, but I didn't feel any sort of struggle that would indicate such. Maybe an otter, I thought. But again, I didn't feel a struggle when I reeled it in. I tried to ignore this and moved on to the opposite side of the island, resuming my fishing. But again, the next thing I hooked suddenly stopped fighting. I pulled up another shredded fish carcass. This happened a few more times as I was just curious at this point as to what was happening. I looked toward the island and felt such dread like the island itself had eyes and was staring me down. I slowly rode myself away to another spot closer to the cabin and started to catch some actually intact fish, all the while taking brief glances at that island. After hauling in a decent-sized bass, I heard Rachel pull into the driveway, so I decided to make my way back and try to forget about this experience. Over dinner, I casually brought up the island to Rachel. So I saw there was this island in the middle of the lake. Have you ever been to it? I asked. Oh, that? Nah, my dad always just told us to not go over there. He said the land is still owned by the family of some woman who used to live there. She responded. Wait, someone used to live there? How? I asked. Yeah, he said that there was a woman who had a house there. She owned some knick-knack shop in town till around 50 years ago when she died. She'd have to row to the dock every morning just to get to her car, she explained. Must have been a pain in the butt to get groceries there, I said with a laugh. Yeah, my dad said she was super creepy, and they would sometimes catch her staring at them from the shore while they fished. 
she elaborated. Well, that's just weird, I said, kind of laughing it off. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure none of it was real. I think he just told us those things to keep us from going to the lake and messing around, she said with a laugh of her own. The rest of the day was spent playing various board games, reading, and just lounging around the cabin. However, each time I passed the living room window, I felt that distinct feeling of being watched. Each time I would glance out to see that island looming in the distance. Curiosity was starting to nag at me, especially now that I was told that there was a house sitting by itself, probably untouched there for decades. A few days passed by, and we spent our time doing more of the same. While relaxing like this was exactly what I needed, I couldn't get my mind off of that island. I had barely done any fishing since I did my first trip on the lake, as I always felt like something just didn't want me there. I couldn't take it anymore. I decided that once Rachel fell asleep, I was going to row out there to check it myself. It probably was just some urban legend her dad had concocted to scare the kids. But part of me wanted to know if it was real. Wanted it to be real. I sat up in bed reading, waiting for Rachel to fall asleep. She fell asleep faster than anybody had ever met and could sleep through a hurricane, so I knew I wouldn't have to wait too long. She really wasn't a fan of anything creepy, and going to an abandoned house in the middle of the night was not something she'd be interested in. But I did feel kind of bad doing this without telling her. Then again, I knew she would just protest if she knew. I grabbed my heavy-duty flashlight, a hunting knife just in case, and my phone to record anything noteworthy. Rachel was asleep within minutes of laying her head down, and after waiting maybe 20 just to be safe, I turned out the lights and quietly made my way out of the cabin. It was dead quiet outside as I made my way down to the dock. No frogs, no crickets, nothing making a sound that night. I pushed off the dock and rowed my way toward the island. Each dip of the oars into the water seemed so loud in the complete silence of the night. I was so anxious to see if Rachel's dad's stories were true or just legend. Either way, there was something off about this island, and I desperately wanted to see it for myself. I pulled up to it and circled around for a minute. The moon was bright enough for me to see the shoreline as I scanned for any spots that were clear enough for me to set anchor. Finally, I spotted a stump jutting out from the land that was partially submerged. The boat drifted towards it as I grabbed a hold and hoisted myself onto the land. I tied the rope to the stump, and after making sure it was secure, I clumsily stepped through the thick brush until I made my way onto what appeared to be someone's yard. I switched on my flashlight to see a disheveled home sitting in the very middle of the island. It stood two stories with rotting walls and a caved-in roof. No way, I thought to myself. There really is a house here. All of the windows were broken, and the entirety of the house was suffocated by an overgrowth of ancient vines. The trees were so dense around it that it blacked out the sky above as this house stood, forgotten by time. I remembered to pull out my phone right then to capture anything I might find. I swept the beam of light over the house after I hit record, then I made my way over. My feet crunched on fallen, dead branches and leaves. That sense of dread returned to me with a vengeance. I'd come this far, and I was not going to turn back now. I shined the light on the front door that sat ajar. I shone the light through the openings where the windows used to be. It was eerie, to say the least. Whoever lived here really must have owned a knick-knack shop or something, because dozens of miscellaneous items were strewn across the floor, coated in years of thick dust. A box spring mattress looked as if it had been thrown across the room as it sat partially upright against a decaying wall. I put my weight into the door and it agonizingly creaked open, letting out decades of neglect. The air was dense and unforgiving as I swept my phone all around to record all these long forgotten memories. Dozens of various trinkets, household tools, and ceramic animals covered the floors as I carefully stepped over the abandoned piles. I shifted the light to one corner of the room and felt my heart jump 
where I saw a pile of maybe a dozen baby dolls lying in a heap. I made my way towards them as the floor creaked and groaned. I was seriously starting to get the creeps as I noticed it was significantly colder in the house than it was outside in the summer night. Some of the dolls were missing their heads, while others had dirty and torn clothing on them. Right above the pile, I noticed a picture hanging on the wall. I blew off the thick coat of dust and went into a coughing fit as it blew directly back into my eyes and down my throat. When I came to, I saw it was one of those creepy old-timey photos of a family where no one was smiling, just vacant expressions staring back at me. There was a 30-something-year-old woman holding a baby with two little boys sitting by her sides. I realized they were standing in front of the house that I was currently invading. I turned around, and my blood ran cold. Standing at the opposite edge of the room in a doorway was a small boy lit up in the beam of my flashlight. I jumped out of my skin and screamed as the light illuminated this figure. He was maybe seven or eight years old, with sandy blonde hair and deep brown eyes. The light in his face didn't seem to bother him as he stared straight through me. I quickly recognized his face as one of the boys in the photograph. Sir, what are you doing here? The words slithered out of his mouth and up my spine, sending a cold chill throughout my body. I sat there dumbfounded as I stammered at the ghostly figure. Can you help my brother? Please, sir. The boy requested of me. I was speechless. He quickly turned and darted into the room behind him. I stood there for a moment, but then I realized I had all of this on video and I was seeing dollar signs. This was the most incredible and terrifying thing I'd ever witnessed. I took a deep breath, made sure the phone was still recording, and made my way into the room. I passed through the doorway and into a room that looked pristine. Clean floors, painted walls, and wooden rocking chairs. It even appeared that night had turned back into day, as the room looked dimly lit in the early morning light. I spotted yet another child off in the corner, just sitting on the floor, looking away from me, while the one who urged me into the room was leaning over something wrapped up on a couch. I made my way over to him, then glanced over his shoulder to see a baby cuddled up in a blanket cocoon. He feels cold, sir. He hasn't made a sound in a long time, and we don't know what's wrong. The little boy said to me with sadness in his voice. The other child began rocking nervously, Hands clenched around his legs as he formed into a little ball. Can you help us, sir? The boy pleaded. The rocking child began to whimper and mumble under his breath. I'm sorry. I don't know what I can do to help. I spoke to him. Is your mother around? She can help you. It was at that moment that I heard a sound coming up from a staircase that I hadn't seen before. It started out very faint. But as the sound gradually grew, I could make out the heartbreaking sound of a woman crying. It persisted until it was a full-fledged wail that was ringing throughout the house. The boy rocking in the other corner quickly rose and sprinted out of the room. You should leave, mister. She doesn't like visitors. At that moment, it was like something flipped a switch and the once immaculate room was now dark and cluttered with disgusting furniture that it was torn and rotting. The wailing from upstairs hadn't ceased, and I heard loud, vicious stomping on the floor, right above me, rapidly, making its way to the staircase and starting the descent to the room I was in. I felt frozen in place. I shined the light down onto the couch to see a dirty, dust-caked doll lying there in a blanket. I looked back up at what sounded like a raging bull hit the bottom of the stairs, then just stopped. So did the crying. I fell back and waited for what felt like hours for something to show itself. I tried to crawl backwards as my legs seemed to stop working. After what felt like an eternity, it started its way towards me, and my heart sank. Thud, thud, thud. Each pause between the steps was more suspenseful than the last. I sat there, hands shaking as my flashlight trembled with them. 
I tried to force myself to turn it off, but it was too late. I watched in horror as a figure dark as night with long wispy hair and gangly limbs lumbered into the room. It seemed to stop and face me for a moment, and I could feel tears running down my face. After a brief pause, it made its way to the couch. It looked down at the old doll and stroked its head with long bony fingers. It let its face collapse into its hands, and it began sobbing once more. Same as before, it gradually grew louder and louder until it was nearly deafening. It picked up the doll and held it tight to its chest before letting out an ear-piercing scream of pure despair. I was somehow able to get enough of a grip and pull out my knife, but as I did, this thing's neck violently twisted towards me and postured up. It towered high above me as its head nearly grazed the ceiling. At last, my legs found the strength I needed, and adrenaline kicked in. I stopped the video and pocketed my phone before making a mad dash for the door. I heard rapid, heavy stomps close the distance instantly, and I felt a tremendous force knock me through the doorway that I'd been running through. I frantically looked up as my flashlight had fallen from my hands, but I could still make out the figure hurling itself through the beam of light which was coming from the flashlight wherever it had landed. A symphony of screaming and crying was coming from this thing. It stood over me as it pinned me to the ground with immense strength. I managed to shake my arm free. I then attempted to slash at its face with the knife, but it grabbed my wrist with such force that I felt it was going to snap my arm. It clenched its cold hands around mine and slowly guided the knife down towards my stomach. I tried punching it with my now free hand as it slowly lifted my shirt and began running the blade down my abdomen. I screamed out in pain as it pierced my skin. I felt warm blood slide down my sides. My free hand frantically grasped for anything to use to defend myself with when I felt it go over a large piece of broken glass. Without hesitating, I grabbed it and stuck the thing in its eye. It let out a horrible cry and fell off me as I managed to sprint out of the house and into the boat. I could hear it crying that same mournful wail as I pushed the boat off and made it back to the cabin. I pulled in and tied the boat down before sprinting up to the house, but when I opened the door, I heard a horrible sound. The same crying was coming from somewhere inside my cabin. It sounded muffled at first, but grew in volume as I approached our bedroom. I made my way to the door, and as I opened it, the crying stopped. All I saw was Rachel slumbering peacefully the way I'd left her. I checked the closets, checked under the bed, checked every room in the house, but could find no sign of anything out of the ordinary. I dove under the covers and curled up tightly next to Rachel, my body trembling in terror. I decided right there we were leaving the following day. I couldn't be here anymore. I don't know if it was exhaustion or the result of high adrenaline wearing off, but I somehow found sleep after cowering under the covers for a while. I had a dream, though. It was me walking to the shore of the island. I could see our cabin in the distance, a small candle in the living room providing it enough light to be seen. However, I had no control over my movements. Whatever I was actually seeing through looked down at the water, dove in, and began swimming furiously toward the cabin. All the way, I screamed for it to stop, but it only gained speed. It climbed onto the dock and sprinted at an unnatural speed, the earth seeming to shake underneath its feet. It opened the door of the cabin, slowing its pace, carefully making its way through the living room then down the hall. It stopped and looked right at the bedroom door. It creaked open the door and walked inside. There I was, sleeping like a baby. I watched its disgusting, monstrous fingers slowly reach down towards me before violently grabbing me by the throat. I jolted awake and immediately shook Rachel up. We have to go now. What? She replied in a groggy tone. Just start packing. We're leaving right now. 
I rushed her into the car and hastily threw everything I could find before speeding down the unpaved road and away from the place. Rachel groggily asked me what was wrong, but I couldn't seem to answer. I felt as though I was in shock and I couldn't get any words to come out. It was then that I remembered the video. I'd recorded it all. I pulled out my phone and handed it to Rachel. Go through the videos. Watch the most recent one, I told her. I don't understand what I'm looking at here, she said in an exhausted voice before handing me the phone after watching for a few minutes. What? Please, babe, just watch it through, I pleaded with her. She mumbled something but was already asleep again. I didn't really care that she wouldn't see it now. I was just happy to be getting away from that place and back home. I stopped at a rest stop a few hours into the trip. The sun had just finished rising. After making a trip to the bathroom and grabbing a few sodas from a vending machine, I decided to take a look at the video myself. Either Rachel was just half asleep, or the video didn't come out clear like I'd hoped. I pulled open the video, and my heart sank. There was no house in front of me, just dense brush and a huge pile of bricks and wood. The remains of a home. I scrolled through two hours of footage of me just standing there, staring straight ahead at nothing. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I scrolled through the video, and it was over three hours straight of me just standing there. I went to the end of the video, before some movement finally caught my eye. Because the end of the video consisted of me slowly pulling up my shirt, dragging a knife across my stomach, and grunting in pain, before I dropped the knife and sprinted back to the boat in a panic, making my way back to the cabin. For several hours of the drive, I just sat in silence, unable to comprehend what all had happened. Even when Rachel took over driving, I would not let myself fall asleep in fear of having another nightmare. I didn't want to tell her, and I hoped that she was too tired to even remember me showing it to her. After the long 17-hour drive was finally over, we started to unload our stuff from the car. Rachel was gathering up all of her things while I started to haul in the larger pieces of luggage into the home. I walked into the house and set down all the luggage I was carrying. I felt a sense of unease take over. The air was thick and heavy and the house was freezing cold. I reached for our doorknob to the bedroom and felt my heart sink. Just beyond the door, I could hear the faint sound of a woman sobbing. A few weeks back, a good friend of mine from college called me up and asked if I wanted to spend a week or so with him up at his great aunt's lake house in the mountains of Virginia. His great aunt had recently passed away and the family was still in the process of sorting out the will. However, it was looking pretty certain that the cabin and the surrounding property were going to be sold off fairly soon. Besides, most of the beneficiaries of the will lived halfway across the country, so they were glad to have someone look after the place instead of just leaving it empty. With that in mind, we decided to meet up there and take a few days to unwind, and of course, catch up. Now, my friend had told me a few things about this cabin prior to going, and he had warned me that it was a little bit old and run down. I took that in stride, but I was not prepared for just how old and run down it really was. Because, apparently, the building and the surrounding outbuildings had been around since the 40s, well before the river in the valley below had been dammed to create the lake. The cabin was small, but it was still reasonably nice, even if the porch and some of the outbuildings seemed like they would collapse at any moment. The nicest part of this cabin, however, was how sublimely quiet the whole area was. Even though the other end of the lake was heavily developed, the shoreline where the cabin was located was very rocky and mountainous, so there were no other neighborhoods or marinas in the area. In fact, other than the occasional sounds of a particularly loud boat going by in the distance, the wilderness was almost spookily quiet. Almost. 
It took the better part of the afternoon to air out the musty cabin and to get unpacked. Then the final step was finding somewhere to stow the little John boat I'd brought along. The forecast called for rain during the night, and I had foolishly forgotten the tarp at home, but the old barn seemed just the ticket for storing the boat. I backed the trailer over to the barn, but when I went to roll open the sturdy double doors, I found them bound together by a heavy stone chain and the biggest padlock I'd ever seen. I also noticed that there were two large and fairly new 4x4 timbers bolted onto the exterior walls of the barn to keep the main doors from rolling open. That was definitely strange, sure, but considering the ramshackle condition of the barn, I figured the boards and chains were probably just meant to keep anyone from going inside the unsafe structure. A safety precaution. I figured I would just back the boat into the wood shed instead, but just as I turned away from the barn, I heard a rustling inside. It wouldn't have been out of the ordinary at all, except for the fact that it seemed to be coming from high up in the barn, well above where your average rat would be hiding. I pressed my ear to the door of the barn for a few moments, but the rustling didn't come again. However, if I listened closely, I could hear breathing. It was like the breathing of a goat or a sheep or even a small calf. It was slow and steady, and it was certainly stronger than the shallow and sharp breaths of a rat or a squirrel. My curiosity was piqued. I then pressed my eye to the thin slit in between the two barn doors, trying to get a glimpse of whatever was inside. I could not see anything within, except for a few beams of light slanting in through holes and openings in the barn's upper structure. But then, I was jolted away from my concentration by the sound of my friend's voice from up by the cabin, asking me if I needed some help. No thanks, man. I've got it. I called back before taking one last look at the barn and getting back in the truck. By the time I cleaned out a spot in another one of the outbuildings and got the boat trailer inside, the sun was starting to sink below the treetops. On top of that, my stomach was beginning to rumble. When I headed back to the cabin, I was elated to find my buddy putting a couple of sandwiches on the freshly cleaned kitchen table. As we ate our simple but satisfying dinner, I told him about the odd sounds I'd heard coming from inside the barn. He shrugged, said it was probably just a raccoon or possum. Made sense to me, I guess, but when I mentioned the boards and the lock and the chain on the doors, a more quizzical look crossed his face. That's weird. I found almost the exact same thing done to the attic door here in the house, he said, gesturing towards the other end of the room. I got up from the table and walked over to the rickety staircase, and sure enough, the trap door at the top of the stairs was covered with three fresh 2 by 4 boards, and the latch was bound with a heavy-duty padlock. Of course, the cabin wasn't in much better condition than the barn and the plaster ceiling had several holes in it that showed through to the attic, so maybe that was the reason for the boards and the lock. Our conversation soon moved on to other subjects, and before long we had forgotten the strange locked doors entirely. We stayed up for about two more hours, catching up with one another and laying out our fishing supplies for the next day. Finally, though, we both decided to call it a night, since we had planned to get up early the next day and head out onto the lake. There was only one bedroom in the house, so I opted to take the couch, and in the calm silence of the isolated cabin, it didn't take me too long to drift off to sleep. My rest was not peaceful, however. All night long, I experienced nightmare after nightmare, I dreamt of mazes and dark woods, of claws and fangs and men without faces, never once waking from my sleep, but instead simply tumbling from one dream to the next. 
When I woke up early the next day, I was exhausted. I felt as though I had run a marathon in the night rather than sleeping at all. And as I brewed a cup of coffee for the morning, my friend shambled into the kitchen. It was apparent that he had also slept poorly. Did you by chance have a bunch of weird dreams last night? I asked as he rubbed his eyes in the morning light. Mm-hmm, you do? He answered and asked me in return. I nodded and we both resolved that maybe it had just been something we had eaten the night before. Once we both had our dose of caffeine for the morning, we packed up our gear and put the boat in the water. However, as I walked by the old barn on the way to the water's edge, I couldn't help but stop and press my ear to the boards again. The sound of breathing was still there, but this time it was slower, more gentle, like an animal that was sleeping quite soundly. I quickly made my way down to the boat, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something off about everything around the old cabin. Nevertheless, we spent the whole day fishing and swimming and motoring around the lake, so the nightmares and boarded-up doors were soon far from my mind. In fact, we stayed out on the lake well into the evening, and by the time we returned to the cove with the cabin, it was dark enough that we needed to use a flashlight to dock. As we were unpacking all of our fishing gear and life jackets from the boat, I suddenly became aware of a strange new sound mixed in with the constant backdrop of peeping frogs and chattering cicadas. It was the sound of flapping wings. Now, we had spooked a few large blue herons around the lake that day, and several great gray owls make their home on the family farm, but this sound was not like either of those. It was bigger. I stood there and listened as the sound made slow circles around the cove, but whenever I pointed my flashlight into the air, I saw nothing but the tops of pines and poplars. Hey, what's going on? My friend asked, looking up at me from the boat. Shh, do you hear that? What on earth is that? I whispered back. He stopped and listened and he gradually developed the same confused expression as me. It's probably just a heron, dude. Stop worrying so much. He said with less than complete certainty. I listened to the flapping as it circled for a few more moments, but finally I decided to take my friend's advice and just stop worrying about it. I headed inside, but between getting such little rest last night, and an exhausting day on the lake. My buddy and I both soon felt our eyelids getting heavy. So we said goodnight and headed off to bed. Despite my borderline exhaustion, I couldn't sleep. I lay there on the couch tossing and turning, simply staring at the ceiling above me. As I lay there awake, thinking about the events of the day, I was basically jerked out of my thoughts by the sudden thunk of something hitting the roof. I figured that maybe an old dead branch had tumbled down onto the roof as the wind had picked up a little outside and there was even thunder in the distance. But soon I also heard a scrabbling, scratching sound. It was coming from the attic above me. I laid there stone still, listening as the scratching came in little bursts and waves. As though something was taking its time and picking its way through the attic. The scratching grew closer and closer, eventually sounding as though it were practically right above my head. But after a momentary pause, it began moving back in the other direction. However... In the darkness of the cabin, I could not make out anything through the holes in the ceiling, except for an occasional flash of movement. As unsettling as the whole thing was, I kept telling myself to stay calm. It was probably just a squirrel or something like that. But then I remembered the flapping sound from earlier, and I decided 
it was well worth trying to investigate. I grabbed my flashlight from the floor and quietly moved in the direction of the scratching, following it through the small kitchen area and down the hallway towards the room where my friend was staying. Every few seconds, I would click the flashlight on for a moment, shining it at the ceiling and trying to catch a glimpse of something through the numerous holes and cracks of the ceiling. Finally, the scratching made its way beyond the door to where my friend was sleeping, and not wanting to disturb him, I figured I would just head back and try to get some sleep. Again, I didn't have much to go on, so I had to assume it was some rodent. Luckily though, or perhaps very unluckily, something in the back of my mind made me turn towards the door to the bedroom again. I pressed my ear to the door, listening for any trace of scraping or scratching, but instead, I heard something more familiar. A deep, heavy breathing that I'd heard in the barn the day before. Before you ask, I'm certain it wasn't the breathing of my friend in his bed, because I could hear that too, breathing and rustling beneath the sheets. But this other sound was the breathing of a medium-sized animal, deep and steady and voluminous. If you've ever worked around cows or horses, you know just the sound I'm talking about. Likewise, as I listened, I heard my friend begin to breathe more erratically, and his tossing and turning grew wilder, more agitated, as though he were having a very active nightmare. I could no longer contain my frightened curiosity, so I eased the door open as slowly and quietly as I could, creating a roughly six-inch crack to peer into the dimly moonlit room. To my horror, I could see the vague silhouette of a long, thin object hanging down from the ceiling just above my friend's bed as he tossed and turned, contorting himself in his sleep as though he was trying to avoid the touch of some unseen attacker. Initially, I was worried that the dangling silhouette might be a snake, trailing itself down from the attic and on to my unsuspecting friend. However, when I turned on my flashlight and illuminated the room, what I saw was much, much worse. The slender shadow above my friend was not a snake, Instead, it was a long, glistening, pinkish tongue. Above my friend's bed, protruding through one of the many holes in the worn-out ceiling, was a slender snout, covered in fur the color of rust, and lined with thin, leathery, brownish-black lips. Oh! A terrified shout and a few choice expletives sprang uncontrollably from my mouth before I could cover it and I took an involuntary step backwards, recoiling in disgust and shock. Thanks to my sudden outburst, my friend woke with a start, only to utter a scream of his own upon seeing the grotesque creature above him. He clambered back across the bed, pressing himself against the wall at the head of the bed. The tongue quickly began to retract back up to the ceiling, while a cacophony of squeaking and scratching echoed from the ceiling above. As the tongue slithered back into the protruding maw, the snout quickly disappeared, back through the hole in the ceiling. Immediately, the scratching from earlier resumed and began to make its way quickly back through the attic above us. Snapping himself out of his shocked stupor, my friend sprang from the bed, running past me and into the kitchen. He grabbed a broom and began whacking and beating at the ceiling, following that scratching along its path toward the front of the house. I followed him as he began to beat upon the ceiling. I shined the flashlight upwards, trying to catch a glimpse of whatever it was through the holes and slits in the decrepit ceiling. Then, to our great dismay, the handle of the broom went clean through the ceiling in the middle of the living room. His efforts were rewarded with a surprised shriek and a chorus of panicked scratching and skittering from the attic above 
informing us that he had made contact with the thing in the attic. Our excitement was short-lived, as the scratching noise was quickly overpowered by the groan of old wood and the crumpling of ancient plaster. Chips and chunks of the plaster ceiling began to fall. A few seconds later, an enormous section of the rotten planking fell through into the living room floor directly in front of us, bringing the very unwelcome guest with it. I angled the flashlight into the dusty mass on the floor, and what I saw in the midst of the rubble was not something that I will ever forget. Lying there, scrambling to reorient itself, was a creature that most closely resembled a bat. However, it was far larger than any bat I'd ever heard of, its body was the size of a large dog, and although its wings were curled close to its body at the moment, they would likely have been five or six feet across when fully spread, if I had to guess. Its entire body was covered in the same rust-red fur that carpeted its long snout, and its eyes were bulbous and glassy, squinting in discomfort against the bright assault of my flashlight. Its mouth bore no teeth, but the fingers at the joints of its wings had formidable claws. It squeaked and hissed furiously, swinging the tip of one wing at my friend as it pulled itself free of the debris on the ground. At that point, I came to my senses and remembered my 44 Magnum was in the cab of the truck outside. I shouted to him that I had to get it before dashing out of the side door. I retrieved my revolver in a hurry when I heard the shattering of glass from the cabin behind me. My friend was shouting in a panic. I ran back toward the front of the house only to see the shadowy shape of that creature lifting off from the porch next to a freshly broken window, climbing rapidly into the night sky. If I looked closely, I could track its shape across the blue-black velvet of the sky, but it was far too high and moving way too fast to get a shot off at. At least it was gone. My friend and I took a moment to assess the situation, and he quickly made the decision to burn down the old barn. He believed that that was where the thing, or perhaps things, must have been hiding and living. All of the buildings would be destroyed by whatever developer bought the land anyway, so nobody would be out of anything as far as we could tell. Besides, I wasn't about to argue with him after the night we just had. I silently spread fuel oil around the base of the barn. Once everything was packed into the trucks, we ignited the volatile mixture and wordlessly walked to our vehicles, listening closely for any sounds of wings in the air above us. Finally, when the massive barn was suitably ablaze, my friend called 911 to report a lightning strike and subsequent fire. Then the two of us quickly got on our way before the wail of distant sirens grew too close. I've done a plethora of research on just what it was that we saw that night, but I've never found a good explanation. The animal's looks and features most closely matched that of a fruit bat, with its long, toothless snout and extending tongue. But no fruit bat anywhere around the world reaches anything close in size to what we witnessed. If it was, in fact, an herbivorous fruit bat, what was it doing perched above my friend's bed? And are the nightmares we both experienced connected to it in any way? More importantly, was it a lone freak of nature, or was it just one member of a larger colony? Were the barn and attic boarded up to keep it out, or were they failed attempts to keep it in? I have plenty of lingering questions about what we saw that night but I doubt I'll get any answers. The one thing I can say for certain about the whole ordeal is that that thing, it's still out there because it flew off into the night. So God knows where it ended up. Who knows where it's making its home now.
The following story is a historical account. As we all understand, war is hell in multiple ways. But even when you're fighting a war and you know death is to be expected, sometimes there are events that challenge your sanity and will to survive. This is a tale written for us from Gold Star Tank Expert about a bizarre and very true story from World War I. Attack of the Dead Men. This is an actual historical account. The story begins in September of 1914 in Northeast Poland at a fortress known as Osowiec Fortress. During the early years of WW1, the Russians were holding the fortress, which was situated near their border. They knew the German army was approaching and were ready to hold the fortress until the very last man. The German army arrived, attacking with their larger army, but the Russians held their own despite being outnumbered two to one. Knowing that this might happen, the Germans quickly brought up their artillery and began shelling the fortress. The real battle began with the Germans attacking and the Russians managed to drive them off with their own artillery and light weapons fire. In all, the Germans fired over one million rounds of various kinds of artillery pieces. But even with all that blast power, the fort remained standing and the Russians remained defiant. The Germans knew they had to break the Russians' defenses so they called in Field Marshal Hindenburg, who brought along some 42 centimeter Big Bertha siege mortars to try and finally finish the Russian defenders off. After several days of a continuous barrage from the artillery and the Big Berthas, the Russians still refused to leave the fortress, despite their quickly dwindling numbers. Field Marshal Hindenburg knew that the only way for him to take the fortress was to fight dirty. Knowing that the Russian troops were not issued gas masks, he called for canisters of chlorine and bromine gas, then waited for when the winds were favorable. When the time came, the canisters were opened and a greenish haze drifted toward the fortress. Tree leaves turned yellow, the grass changed to a sickly black as the gases took effect and the Russians dropped like flies as they had no way to counter this. Hindenburg had his men wait until a few hours had passed so the gases could take their effect. Then he sent 7,000 men equipped with gas masks toward the fortress. Now, this is where the really terrifying part begins. The German infantry are slowly advancing through no man's land, which is a shell cratered mess of barbed wire and the remains of soldiers. A greenish haze is covering everything. They can hear the occasional sounds of Russian troops coughing and perishing from the fortress. The German troops began looking around, trying to find any survivors, but their vision is limited as the gas masks of the time had small glass eyepieces to look through and their range of vision was quite small. As they approached, one of the soldiers in the lead suddenly freezes. A gasp of pain escapes his mask as the tip of his bayonet is seen protruding through his back. The other soldiers look on in absolute horror as their now fallen comrade hits the ground and reveals his attacker. It is a Russian soldier, his mouth covered by a rag, his eyes bloodshot, and he is covered in severe chemical burns anywhere bare skin can be seen. More haggard Russian soldiers emerge from the green haze, all burned and hacking up pieces of their innards. The German troops stop their advance and turn away in sheer terror as the 50 Russians mount a bayonet charge, skewering any German that got in their way, all the while moaning, coughing, screaming in pain as they continued. The ones that stopped charging raised their rifles and began to fire on the terrified Germans, who were now in full retreat. Then the Russians managed to get their three remaining artillery pieces inside the fortress, working again, bringing even more Germans to their demise. Hindenburg was shocked at this defeat and quickly ordered another attack, but the men were too scared to obey. 
It would take them until the next day to take the fortress, despite the horrible condition of their enemy. The Russians who mounted the zombie-like bayonet charge perished shortly after, having scared the living daylights out of the German army. Fewer than 20 Russians evacuated the fortress before the Germans took it. However, that is not the end of the tale of a Soviet fortress. Legend says that in 1918, the Russians returned to the battered fortress to reclaim and rebuild it. They discovered a survivor there of that battle, deep in the lower levels of the fortress. He had resorted to eating his fellow comrades to stay alive, and had been in the darkness for so long that when the medical team brought him outside, he went blind from the sunlight. Whether this small part is true or not, we may never know, but the soldiers' stories of the near-undead attack that happened that fateful day live on, being dubbed the Attack of the Dead Men by the newspapers. The ruins of Osoviak Fortress still stand as a memorial to the brave men who lost their lives that day. Who knows, maybe some of them still stand guard over the stone walls. It's a cool and creepy change of pace to have an actual historical account represented here. That being said, stay tuned for tomorrow's video on Real Army Ghost Stories, when the phantoms of the past come back to haunt and remind the living of the horrors of war. Good night. I heard my own voice calling me upstairs from Sarah. We lived on the outskirts of one of the biggest cities in North Carolina. Before my current boyfriend and I began dating, we were best friends for five years. Needless to say, I was over at his place quite often, almost all the time. He and his brother lived in an old apartment townhome in a poor part of town that was built back in the 70s and hadn't really been updated much since. As you can imagine, it was pretty run down. Ever since I first visited the place, I had a bad feeling about it. There was a certain oppressive energy to that place. It's hard to explain without making me sound paranoid. Sometimes you could hear footsteps despite no one else being there. Things would move on their own occasionally. This activity wasn't too bad at first. When I moved in, I was sleeping on the couch. My then old boyfriend had just broken up with me. This was when I really began to notice just how active, for lack of a better word, this place truly was. The longer I was there, the more the activity would escalate. Now, my entire life, I felt that something has followed me wherever I go. I remember often seeing this shadowy figure when I was young, following me around in my childhood apartment. And from there, it stayed with me to my college dorm room, my ex-girlfriend's house, and so on. Everywhere I went, no matter how near or far, how permanent or temporary, this shadowy figure would be there. Sure, there would be a quiet delay for a month or so, then it would start to show itself again. It was as though it had to take time to find where I'd gone before reattaching itself to me, or perhaps it was letting me get comfortable, lulling me into a false sense of security. Anyway, not long after moving in with my current boyfriend, Steve, I began seeing this shadow figure again. I wasn't surprised. I would be sitting on the couch watching TV, and at the end of the long hallway to my right, toward the front door, I would see it in my periphery, gliding from the bottom of the stairs, which was just inside the front door, and into the kitchen. A short while after seeing this, 
Out of the corner of my eye, I would catch what appeared to be the shadow figure's head popping out of the doorway leading to the living room from the other side of the kitchen. Every time I would turn to look, it would disappear. Imagine someone poking their head into a room and then quickly retreating when they saw that you were looking, like they didn't want you to actually see them. I saw this every day for a week or so before Steve told me that he was seeing the exact same thing, despite the fact that I had never mentioned this to him yet. This confirmed to me that I had not been imagining it and that whatever this thing was, it had found me yet again. This went on for another month, then it changed from almost curious to threatening. Steve, our friend CJ, and I were hanging out in the living room, drinking, talking, and having a good time. Steve and I began to tell CJ about the shadow figure we had been seeing. That was the night we found out that this thing apparently did not like us talking about it, because suddenly, an ashtray sitting in the center of the coffee table flew off of it violently, crashing into the nearby wall with extreme force, leaving quite the memorable hole in the wall. It was like someone backhanded the thing in a burst of anger. The three of us were shocked, exchanging looks as if to say, how the heck did that happen? Fast forward a few days, at this point, Steve and I were testing the waters, so to speak. It was late one night, probably around three in the morning. We were cuddling on the couch watching some crime show. His stepbrother, Chris, was gone for the week, so we had the apartment to ourselves. The cat, Swirls, was curled up and snoozing in my lap. Long story short, there shouldn't have been any other noise anywhere else in the house. At one point, we were both beginning to doze off when we were suddenly startled by a loud thump directly above us. It came from where Chris's bedroom was. Swirls instantly straightened up on high alert. We stared at the ceiling together and muted the TV so that we could hear it better. A few moments passed by then the silence was broken by yet another, followed by what sounded like heavy footsteps. They moved from Chris's room across the hall into Steve's room, then stopped before retreating back to Chris's room, stopping again where his closet would be. Steve. My eyes widened and Steve sharply inhaled. Steve, come up here. I want to show you something. I looked up at Steve, and I could see that he was as disturbed as I was. That, that sounded like Chris, I whispered. He's not supposed to be back for another four days, right? Steve nodded. Swirl stood up, his back arched and tail puffed out, the way cats do when they feel threatened. He began to stare down the dark hallway at the base of the stairs. Steve got up slowly, his brow furrowed with worry, then began to walk through the kitchen to look out the window towards the parking lot. He's not here. His car's not here. He told me this as he took a few steps toward the staircase. Just as he made it to the bottom step and reached to turn on the light up at the top, we heard the door to Chris's room slam shut. Not wanting to separate, I rushed to join him, and as I clung to his arm, we cautiously went upstairs. Sure enough, Chris's door, which had been wide open since he left, was now closed. Steve tentatively reached for the doorknob, then began to open the door. He flipped on the light. We both froze, shocked. 
The room had been completely destroyed. It was now in total disarray. Drawers were hanging open, their contents strewn all over the floor. The bed looked as though its owner had been tossing and turning in his sleep, with the covers torn off the corners of the mattress and the pillows hanging off the edge of the bed. We were so unsure of what to think of this, we just shut the door again and went back downstairs. We both slept on the couch that night, letting that entity do whatever it wanted to do upstairs, as long as we didn't have to be a part of it. As time passed, we were still seeing the shadow figure multiple times a day, every day. It would pass through the hallway in the kitchen, peek into the living room, then move back across the hallway and presumably upstairs. Occasionally, we would see it at the top of the stairs until we would turn the light on and it would disappear. Luckily for us, we hadn't heard that creepy voice again but whenever we would go into Steve's room, we always felt this unnerving, almost magnetic energy coming from Chris's room. It was like something was trying to pull us in, and whatever that something was, it seemed to inhabit Chris's room now. About a month and a half after the first incident, we were lying on the couch together, watching Harry Potter, it was late at night once again, about 3 a.m. I guess we didn't learn our lesson the first time. Chris was gone again, staying the weekend with his girlfriend, so once more we had the place to ourselves. It was then that I noticed the shadow again. It was moving around at the foot of the stairs. It wasn't doing anything out of the ordinary, really, so I didn't put too much thought into it as at that point, it was such a regular occurrence that we just ignored it most of the time. The especially creepy moments, like the night it copied Chris's voice, those were few and far between. I was about to get up to use the bathroom when I heard it, and it sent chills right down my spine, like a lightning strike or an electric shock. Sarah... I was petrified, unable to move. I looked over at Steve, hoping that I had just imagined it, my eyes wide with pure fear. He sat up instantly. I knew that he heard it too. Sarah, where are you? Come here, I can't find you. This time, the voice sounded much more like Steve's. Once again, it was calling us from upstairs, but I was looking right at Steve. He had been sitting next to me. What the hell? My voice was shaking. I was terrified and recalled the last time we heard a voice like that. Steve pulled me close to him, and we sat like that motionless, waiting for what felt like hours. We knew better this time than to explore the upstairs. Besides, this time around, I was too horrified to move from that couch. Several silent long minutes passed. We started to relax a bit, thinking that it was over. But we were wrong. Just when we were feeling alone again, safe again, we heard it. Sarah. It was talking in a whisper now, but this new voice was more terrifying than any before it. It continued. Sarah, Steve, come upstairs. I want you to see this. You see, what was really disturbing to me this time around was that the whisper was my own. It was my voice calling out to me from upstairs. I broke down into tears then, sobs violently racking my body. Together, Steve and I jumped up and we ran for the door. Outside, 
We jumped into Steve's car and drove to his mom's dog grooming shop, about 15 minutes away. It was there that we slept for the remainder of the night, feeling far more at ease on the couch in the break room there, rather than our own apartment. We heard these disturbing and eerie voices several more times before we finally moved out. I have no idea what that thing was, what it wanted, but it clearly was trying to lure us into that room for whatever reason, using voices that it knew were familiar and comforting to us, twisting them into something we should be afraid of. I won't forgive it for that. It used its power and its knowledge to scare us out of our wits. Now we live in a home a half hour outside the city. We've been here a year and a half now, and thankfully, we haven't heard any disembodied voices since we moved out of that apartment. But what scares me is that we still see the shadows. I can't be the only one who grew up in a small town with a few resident creeps. I'm not talking about criminals or stalkers. I'm talking about those people who live in the house on the hill or at the end of the street. The people that everyone knows about, but nobody actually knows. Everyone else in town seems to agree that something is not quite right about them. They never even have visitors. I'm sure you know the type. When I was a little kid, I spent a great deal of time at my grandparents' farm in the foothills of North Carolina. I would explore all around their property, and most of the neighbors would let me explore their lands too. However, there was one man who lived a few miles from the farm who my grandparents warned me about saying that I should never go near, and the neighbors all agreed something about him was a little bit off. The exact reasons people cited were varied, ranging from PTSD to an escapee from a mental asylum, but nobody could say for sure exactly what his problem was. I always followed my grandparents' advice, and I never knocked on the door of the elegant two-story farmhouse where the mysterious man lived. But I nevertheless found myself standing in front of that old farmhouse back in November of last year. I'm a machinist by trade, but sometimes I work odd jobs on the side for some extra cash. I often do jobs using heavy machinery, mostly grading driveways or digging drainage ditches. So when I got a call asking about what my rate would be, for removing about a dozen large tree stumps, I was excited at the prospect of an extra payday. However, when I arrived at the given address, I was more than a little bit surprised to find that it was the oh-so-familiar home of the mystery man from my childhood. I slowly rolled up the long gravel driveway, suddenly trepidatious about meeting the man that I'd been told to avoid my whole life. Finally, I reasoned with myself that surely the resident must simply be an old shut-in, and I scolded myself for being irrational and almost avoiding a perfectly good customer based on childhood gossip. I knocked on the sturdy door of the farmhouse, and after a few moments, the door swung open to reveal an elderly gentleman of about 80 years old. I introduced myself, and he hobbled shakily out of the house, to show me the stumps that needed to be removed. I gave him my estimate for the cost, and he nodded slowly. Mm-hmm, that'll be fine. When can you start? The sooner the better, he said. We shook hands on a date and a price, and as I got back in my truck to leave, I thought to myself that he seemed far less scary than all the rumors might have suggested. Although, as I looked over my shoulder to back down the driveway, a flash of movement from the tree line caught my eye. 
It was only for a second, but I could have sworn I saw a person's face staring out at me from behind one of the trees at the edge of the yard. I had always been told the man lived alone, but I figured it wasn't really that odd for someone to be visiting, right? Maybe it was one of his out-of-town grandchildren exploring the woods, just like I had always done as a kid. I returned a few days later. The stubborn walnut stumps proved no match for my old D7. When I was done, I knocked on the door and informed the owner that I'd finished early, so I'd be billing him for fewer hours of work than anticipated. He smiled dryly and thanked me for my honesty, offering to pay me extra for finishing the job so fast. I initially assured him that it was really no big deal, but then he made me a very tempting offer. He asked if I would like to come and hunt on his land. It was the height of deer season at the moment. I was definitely interested, since his entire 250-acre property was ringed with barbed wire fences and no trespassing signs. In fact, everybody I knew avoided the place due to the rumors and stigma surrounding the owner and that meant that I would probably have a chance at some pretty nice deer if I took him up on the offer. I eagerly accepted and thanked him for the opportunity, and as soon as I had a free weekend, I headed out onto the land. Nearly the entire property was covered in dense forest and pine thickets, so this wouldn't be the usual post-up-in-a-tree-stand-and-wait sort of hunt. This would rather be a real old-school deer stalking. It couldn't have been more than 40 degrees that day, and to make things worse, it was misting rain. It was great weather for hunting, but it certainly made me grateful for my thick clothing and warm socks. I followed a tangle of game trails through the thick woods, seeing plenty of deer tracks, even a few fairly large ones, all leading deeper and deeper into the pines and cedars. I should also mention that the woods were incredibly calm and peaceful, as the gloom and chill of the rainy November day had practically put the entire forest to sleep. In fact, other than the occasional rustle of a small animal dashing through the damp underbrush, the only noises were my own footsteps and the soft pitter-patter of raindrops. The rest of the day passed in much the same way, but by 5.15, it was starting to get too dark to continue, so I decided to turn around and start making my way back to the truck. Luckily, the rain had almost stopped, but a thick fog now hung in the damp evening air. I carefully retraced my steps as the woods became darker and darker. However, just when I was about to pull out my flashlight, I noticed that mine were no longer the only footsteps in the twilight thicket. I stood very still, listening to the movement in the brush as something drew closer. The footfalls were too loud to be deer, and besides even a herd of deer is careful and methodical as they move, pausing regularly and picking their way around any obstacles. In contrast, these footsteps were reckless and constant, and I could hear twigs and low-hanging limbs cracking. This, I realized, was the sound of another person traipsing through the woods. I quietly crouched and hunkered down behind the base of a large poplar tree, making myself small in its shadow. I was worried that whoever was coming might have been a poacher, and I certainly did not want to catch a bullet due to being mistaken for an animal in the murky darkness. As the footsteps grew closer, I realized there was definitely more than one person out there in the fog, and even worse, I couldn't tell exactly what direction they were coming from. I could hear voices too, at least two, maybe three, but they sounded muffled, distorted in the thick mist. I held my breath as I listened closely, and I leaned out from behind the tree just enough to look in the direction of the noise. 
There, about 20 yards away, was the soft glow of an old incandescent flashlight bobbing through the fog, and silhouetted in that light, I could see three nightmarish figures. At first, I couldn't even make sense of what I was seeing. The three silhouettes looked alien and bizarre, each one an amalgamation of human and animal features. However, on closer inspection, I realized the mysterious shapes were actually people. Strange people. The one in front was wearing a deer's skull and antlers on top of its head, as well as a hooded cloak made from crudely cut animal skin. It also carried what looked to be a shovel over its shoulder, and in its hand it held the flashlight responsible for the glow. The second and third figures stood close together, and they both wore a collection of coyote tails like bandoliers across their bodies, along with coyote skulls adorning their huts. As I squinted to look more closely, I could see that they were carrying something between them. It was a large tarp or sack, and judging by how the two coyote men handled it, it was heavy. As I watched the surreal column move wordlessly through the undergrowth, there was suddenly a loud rustling in the brush behind me. I snapped around, struggling to bring my rifle to bear, but when I turned to face the noise, I saw that it was only a fat possum. The little thing just stared at me for a few moments before dashing away back through the woods, but I guess the noise of its passing had gotten the attention of the three animal men, because when I looked back around the tree, the one with the deer antlers had turned back and began to walk in my direction. I held my breath, making myself as small as possible behind the poplar. I silently flipped my rifle safety off. The deer man drew closer and closer, and the ground on either side of my hiding place was bathed in the yellow glow of the flashlight. My blood thrummed in my ears as my heart beat faster and faster. I didn't know for sure if these people would be hostile, but I wasn't about to pop out and introduce myself all the same. The footsteps of the deer man were very close now, and if I listened carefully, I could make out the sound of breathing on the other side of the tree. However, just when I was sure it was about to come around the tree, I heard one of the coyote men call out in the distance. I couldn't tell quite what he said, but I could make out the word heavy, so I assume he was complaining about whatever he was carrying. The light suddenly disappeared as it was pointed back in the other direction, and the footsteps again receded into the distance. I must have waited a good five or ten minutes before getting up from the hiding place unsure of whether or not the bizarre trio had truly left, but when I poked my head around the tree, they were indeed gone. I wanted nothing more than to get the heck out of there as soon as possible, but I couldn't help going and having a quick look at where they had passed. It didn't take me long to locate their footprints, and much to my relief, all three sets I found were normal shoe prints, no giant hooves or paws. However, as I shone my flashlight on the ground and investigated the footprints, something else caught my eye. Right in the middle of the trail, the three of them had left. There was a glistening splotch of red-brown liquid that couldn't be anything but blood. I pointed the flashlight further down the trail, and sure enough, there were more drops and splotches. Further still, there was even a large puddle where the coyote men had stopped as the deer men had backtracked, looking for me. A feeling of nausea brewed in my stomach as I realized the implications of this. I quickly doused my flashlight to avoid broadcasting my presence. Now filled with a rising panic, I got moving back toward the trailhead as quickly and quietly as possible. The rain had started again, and in the foggy darkness, 
I could barely see a few feet in front of me. Even so, I only pulled my flashlight out when I absolutely had to, in case those people were still prowling around. Finally, I stumbled out of those woods at about 7.45, and I hastily jumped in my truck, pulling back onto the road. I was pretty focused on getting out of there, but as I drove past the farmhouse, I noticed none of the lights were on. There were no other cars in the driveway either, so whoever I'd seen in the woods hadn't come in by that route. Once I was safely home, I called the sheriff's office and anonymously reported that I had seen some suspicious men in those woods. I did not mention the animal skin cloaks or the various pelts and skulls. I have no idea if there was ever an investigation, but nothing ever showed up about it in the local paper. As far as I know, no bodies were ever found too and no arrests were made. But I can tell you for certain that there are places in those woods where something could hide and never be found. For the rest of the season, I did not go back there, and I'm not sure if the man's offer was good for more than one season. Even if I got the chance, I don't think I would go back there alone. However, at least now, I think I understand all those warnings from my childhood. I don't think all the neighbors were really that concerned about the old shut-in. I think they knew about those people, using his land for God knows what, and they wanted to keep me and the other children in the area safe from ever wandering into something we shouldn't. After all, who knows what somebody that disturbed in the head would do to a witness in the woods. Hey there, stranger. Would you like to stay in my cabin for the weekend? I'll give you the keys, let you invite your friends over. You can even drink from my liquor cabinet. That would help you drown out the pain. Oh, and turn on some music too, because the screaming coming from the forest at night can be quite irritating. But don't worry about all that. Enjoy the cabin and have a fun last weekend. Grandpa's Best Friend from Mythology Loves Horror. The hunting cabin was just as I remembered it. It was tiny, hardly bigger than a tool shed, and after a year of neglect, dust now coated every surface. I hadn't been there in almost 10 years, not since the last time I went hunting with my grandfather Sebastian. I'd been so terrified by the thing we saw in the woods there that I hadn't wanted to return, and my parents just assumed I was too bored to want to spend two weeks with the boring old man, but Gramps still came to visit us. Thankfully, we never went there. When Gramps passed away a year ago, he left the cabin and the 30 acres surrounding it to his only remaining grandchild. At 20 years old, I had never expected to set foot on the rural mountainside again, much less inherit it, but a bad breakup had left me with the decision of moving into the cabin or into my parents' basement. The choice had almost been hard to make. The local newspaper, the Village Times, had claimed that Gramps died of a bear attack while out chopping firewood behind his cabin. I didn't really buy that story, though, and even as I pulled my beat-up old Ford into the unpaved driveway, I had my hand on my rifle. Though if that thing came back, I was sure it wouldn't do much to it. But still, it made me feel better. I hadn't seen it in a decade, but if that creature was still out there, I would be prepared this time. At least I hoped. Several hours later, I was unpacked, and the cabin was decently clean. All of the utilities were still hooked up, and the refrigerator was well stocked. 
I had taken the week off of work to adjust to my new life, and I was planning on just relaxing for the next few days. My first night and day passed uneventfully, but by the second night, things were getting a little weird. I had spent enough time in the country as a child to be familiar with the wildlife here. Raccoons, skunks, bears, other mammals. But the freshly made claw marks on the side of the cabin, they weren't anything that I recognized. I woke up on my third morning to gouges in the wood, and I was definitely unnerved. They were too large to belong to any small critters, and far too high up to be from coyotes. They were even too wide to be a mountain lion or bear. In this neck of the woods, that ruled out everything logical. As I studied the claw marks, I wondered how I could have slept through them being made. They definitely hadn't been there when I first arrived, and the fresh marks stood out in a bright contrast to the weathered wood of the cabin walls. I supposed a human could have made them with a knife, but I didn't have neighbors for miles. Who would be skulking around out here just to prank me like this? It didn't make any sense. It crossed my mind that maybe my ex might have done it, just to freak me out. But Sandra lived almost 50 miles away and did not have the address for the cabin in the first place. I don't use social media enough to bother listing my new address, and we didn't have friends in common or anything like that. I eventually shrugged it off, deciding to let it go. I knew that worrying about it wouldn't help. That afternoon, though, I found myself driving the 10 miles into town and buying some motion-activated floodlights and a motion-sensing camera. Two more nights passed, and each morning, I woke up to the claw marks getting closer and closer to the cabin door. As much as I wanted to believe it was a prank, I had to admit to myself that the evidence was overwhelmingly against that idea. The floodlights would turn on, and the camera would snap, yet somehow, all I would ever see in the photos was an empty yard. I had even tried to set up a video on my phone, but all it managed to capture was a vague blur of movement at the edge of the screen. I had enough. On the fifth night, I went outside, rifle in hand, settling comfortably on the porch steps. There was no noise, no sound to indicate that the usual nocturnal critters were up and about. I shut all the lights off and waited for the creature that I knew would come. Hours passed, and as 1 a.m. rolled around, I snapped myself out of a doze. I could hear something moving quietly out by the edge of the woods, where I could make out a figure skulking about, its features hidden in the shadows. As the animal drew closer, I rubbed my eyes in disbelief, because there stood Sebastian, my supposedly dead grandpa. He wasn't wearing any clothes. He paused mid-step, his head slowly turning to face me, probably hearing me gasp from shock. Grandpa looked sickly, with skin pale and ribs visible. He was bald now, his once Santa-like beard and hair gone. Grandpa? I called out. I could hear the quiver in my own voice, and my hands were shaking from terror. The rifle had fallen to my lap, nearly forgotten in the intensity of seeing my presumably dead grandfather. I'd been so convinced that what I was about to see would be that antlered creature that I saw years ago, the one I knew killed Sebastian, but I never considered once that my grandpa was still alive. Grandpa! What are you doing? C come inside. Tears were streaming down my cheeks. I didn't care what my grandfather had been doing this whole time or why he was out there. All I cared about was that he was still alive. I wanted to hug him again. Run. Run, you stupid boy. It's coming. His voice barely sounded human anymore. His voice came out all wrong, and before I could respond, Grandpa was bounding into the woods on all fours. He was gone in the blink of an eye, the bushes hardly swaying where he had passed through. 
The woods remained as eerily silent as they had been before, even though my grandfather's retreat should have made a large amount of noise. Not a second later, a low growl came from behind me, the sound reverberating off the cabin walls. A massive creature, the one that I remembered, approached from the side of the cabin. Within seconds, it became clear to me that it wasn't a human or an animal, unless someone was wearing an amazing and terrifying costume. The creature was every bit as surreal as I remembered. Long, pale limbs sprouted from an emaciated torso. An ivory deer skull shined in what little moonlight managed to bleed out through the clouds. It was wearing ragged old buckskin leggings and had beads around its neck. I could not see its eyes, though, but I knew without a doubt that if it had any, it was staring directly at me. I knew not whether it was a Wendigo or a Skinwalker or something else, but it didn't matter. It was here. Before I could take in any more detail, the creature began to laugh, a guttural sound that echoed in my head hauntingly. It was laughing so hard at me that it nearly doubled over. I realized that its limbs were able to wrap around its body almost twice. I raised my rifle, firing several times at it point blank, all of those rounds lodging firmly into the creature's neck and torso. The being looked down at its new piercings, then without a problem, almost comfortably, it began to dig out the bullets at an unhurried pace. It dropped them onto the ground like a child plucking flower petals, and it seemed to sigh in irritation as it dug out the final one. It just spoke. What was going on? What did this thing want? Did Grandpa always know about this horrendous looking thing? My head began to ache with the strain of trying to understand all this. <sighs> it seemed to sigh as if annoyed by the bullets. It then lifted its claw and pointed it at the cabin. Inside, go. Uh, I was all I could get out in reply to this thing speaking to me. I blinked profusely, and the next thing I knew, the monster was gone, and standing there was Rufus, my grandpa Sebastian's best friend. Rufus had been around as long as I could remember and had always been a kind old man. He supposedly lived on the other side of the mountain, even though I'd never actually seen his house, let alone been to it. Rufus just always sort of appeared out of nowhere, often startling us so badly that we had almost shot him a few times. What in tarnation you doing out here, whippersnapper? Rufus? Am I dreaming? <laughs> no, nah, no, nah, you're not dreaming. But you need to get inside before that thing comes back. That thing that looks like your grandpappy. I was shaking so tremendously from fear that I could barely move my limbs at the time, but I managed to navigate the steps. I'm not entirely sure why I obeyed Rufus after seeing that thing, but after seeing Rufus's familiar face... There was something calming about it, making this insane situation more easily dealt with. I needed some semblance of normalcy in that moment, so I went about my usual pre-bed routine, ignoring the fact that nothing made sense anymore. Mindlessly, I made sure all the windows and doors were locked. I took a long, hot shower to relax myself. I crawled into bed, my adrenaline finally calming down. I think I was in shock. I noticed I was repeatedly reassuring myself that I would wake up and everything would be as it should be. Just writing this down was hard enough. I have no idea, no ounce of understanding for what went on that night at the cabin. 
I'm more confused than I ever thought possible. Who really was Rufus? And what was that thing that looked like my grandpa? My most horrifying experience as a cop, an account shared with us by Mythology Loves Horror. I've been a cop since I was 22 years old. I graduated at the top of my class, acing my exams and tests. It wasn't long before I had a job offer after my official graduation. Despite the job being across the country, I eagerly took a flight and flew over, wanting to be seen as dependable and excited. Even so, nothing that they could have taught me in training would have prepared me for the horror that can stem from living in Vermont. If the freezing temperatures or angry bull moose don't kill you, then there's still plenty of other things that will. When I first agreed to take the job as an assistant trainer at the state police barracks in Newport, I thought it'd be all pretty green mountains and delicious maple syrup, but I was wrong. I originally came from Anaheim, California, and I'm convinced that this frigid wasteland will be the death of me. I've always considered myself a tough woman, but I know now that I'm woefully unequipped to handle everything out there. I don't think anyone's equipped to handle a situation like this one. The call that started this experience should have been a standard domestic abuse case, but it turned into something else. In the three and a half years that I've been there, I've seen humans and animals frozen to death, lumberjacks squished by fallen trees, cars that had been totaled after running into a gigantic moose, and timber rattlesnakes that are as mean as any diamond back. I thought all that was bad enough, but I was not prepared to find myself in a situation that I could not logic my way out of. I didn't have any paperwork left to do that Saturday, and because I'm trained in the field, I asked my friend Officer T if I could ride with him on a domestic abuse call that had just come in. His partner had already gone home for the night, so he readily agreed to take me along as backup. As we threw on our jackets and headed out to the snow-dusted patrol cruiser, I felt a flutter of excitement. I hadn't gone out in the field in a few months, and I'd been itching for some action now, especially since my most recent class had graduated. I looked over the notes, ingraining them into my mind. We were to speak with a Mr. B who was the suspected wife beater. Officer T and I drove for about 15 minutes, and eventually we found ourselves on one of those pothole covered roads that Vermont is famous for. The snow was nearly up to our thighs, and even our tactical SUV was having some trouble getting up a few of the icier hills. We cursed our luck at being sent to a residence out in the countryside especially since it was about 7 p.m. and it was pitch black out. It was a concerned neighbor who had called us, and when we got to Mrs. F's house to hear her report, the distressed woman told us that there were strange screams coming from the creek area behind the houses. We'd been under the impression that the fighting had been occurring inside her neighbor's house, but apparently that was not the case. She led us out to her back porch and sure enough, after stepping through the doorway, we heard screams. They were very hard to describe. They sounded like a strangely pinched version of a frantic woman yelling. Each scream lasted for about three to ten seconds, though it never sounded like it was saying actual words. It was more a cry of sheer terror, stuck on an infinite loop. My adrenaline was pumping so hard that I didn't even want to bother knocking on Mr. B's door. Protocol dictates that we could go next door and question the suspect, but under circumstances where someone is clearly in trouble, we're allowed to prioritize their safety over standard inquiries. This being the case, we sprinted from the porch, 
making our way as quickly and carefully as we could towards that awkward sound. Officer T and I heard two more screams. each of them getting louder as we approached the creek. We were both getting a little unnerved, and as we made our way deeper into the woods, we quietly discussed whether or not we thought it was an animal or a person. The screams of a mountain lion can sound just like those of a distressed woman, and our little flashlights weren't doing much to illuminate the shadow-filled forest. We were finally beginning to approach the creek bed, and we hadn't heard a scream for about five minutes. We had begun calling out for someone to come forward if they were there, or to help lead us to whoever was hurt, but there was no other sounds. I had been checking for footprints, but there were only ours and deer tracks. The powdered snow that we were kicking up was causing a fine sheen of mist-like coverage, but even so, we did a thorough sweep of the area and hadn't seen any signs of a blood trail or struggle. Officer T and I were just about to turn back and head for the car when the air around us erupted into a cacophony of shouting, screaming, and savage howling. We were both startled, and I could see my confusion echoed in his face. I opened my mouth to make sure that he was experiencing the same crazy phenomenon that I was and then we heard an exact copy of that scream from when we were on the porch. It came from directly behind us, but there was nothing there but an open clearing. Officer T resolutely marched into the woods on the opposite side of the clearing to investigate. And then there was a chunk of silence for several minutes. I didn't even hear his footsteps crunching for a long time and I was starting to get anxious. About ten minutes later, he emerged from a different direction, and for a split moment, I thought that I saw his eyes shine bright yellow in the beam from my flashlight. I dismissed that thought, knowing that the glint of snow off the light was playing tricks on me. Officer T beckoned me over, but I told him that we needed to get out of here. He looked almost angry for a moment, then he crossed the clearing to me. I watched with unease as he plowed awkwardly through the snow, stumbling like he had been drinking. I was about to ask what was wrong with him when an odd cry came from our right. I nearly screamed out loud. That was the last straw for me. I grabbed Officer T's arm and all but dragged him back through the snow, keeping a firm grip on his bicep so that he wouldn't stumble again. I was 60 pounds lighter than him, but my adrenaline was pumping so strongly that I was able to get us through the snow and up the hill like it was nothing. Just as we got halfway back to the house, the scream came again, this time sounding like it was right next to me. In a panic, I frantically shone my flashlight around in every direction to find it, to find what we were being pursued by, but there was nothing. In that glacial Vermont forest, there was not even a glint of animal eyes, no rustling of bushes, no sounds of footfalls, just tense silence after that scream. As I frantically traced our steps back to the house, a desperate wail sliced through the air. But I swear, I heard it calling my name. By then, I was too horrified to go back out there. I tried my best to keep my wits about me, enough to stop and tell Mrs. F to call us if anything else occurred. But she never did call again, and the officer who did a follow-up the next day did not report anything unusual. That night, I got Officer T and I out of there as fast as the cruiser would go, and I don't regret that choice. I still have no idea what was in those woods, but as an avid outdoors woman, I know no animal makes that kind of well. 
Whenever I bring this up, Officer T just says the same cryptic sentence, telling me that I should be glad I got out of there alive. He says that the danger that night was closer than I knew. I think only he knows how close of a call it was. Something Lives in That Museum, an experience submitted by Jade. When I lived near Abingdon, my middle school decided to take a trip to a museum house near the Barter Theater. I think it was called the Fields Penn 1860 Museum House. To sum it up, it's an old house on the turnoff to get to Abingdon Central Area where G2K and Food City is. It's a great example that shows how life was in the 1800s. When we visited, we learned how the family there would have lived, about how they made their own things to survive. They even showed us how to handcraft our own things and let us try it out. But my favorite part was when they told us to check if diamonds were real, they would use them to carve their names into solid glass, as diamonds are harder than glass. I'm ranting a bit, but the point was for a seventh grader who was into history and art. This was awesome. I had a really great time there. But what I didn't know at the time was that this area and this house were paranormal hotspots. So on our visit, we had made it to the back of the house. The backyard leads to the farmer's market across the road. We were learning about how, back in the day, they would farm bees for their honey and about the economics of selling honey. By that point, I was dead tired. My enthusiasm wasn't as high anymore, and I was ready to go home. I'd rather be home playing games and crashing for the night. The honey room was a small area in the back with a doorway leading to it. To get in, you had to pass by a large, sliding, interlocked door to the back porch, and to get there, you had to go through the doors a few feet behind the honey room that led to the den-like area. The house itself was old, creaky, and any steps you'd make would be heard for miles, which was only made worse by the acoustics of the place, causing everything to echo. Because of this, when I heard no one else in the house at the time, I assumed that the other group we had been with had already loaded back onto the bus. Kids especially going through this old house make a ton of noise, so I was certain we were the last ones there. I was near the back of the group, leaning on the door frame. Near me were these football jocks that picked on me from time to time, but today they were chill. I think we were all just too tired to care anymore. As I stood there, waiting for things to finally get done with, I heard a loud... coming from behind me. My young brain wondered what it was so I poked my head around the corner of the door. The two others with me also did so, looking like something out of a cartoon as they were taller than me, as I was on the bottom, Palmer in the middle, and William on top. Right in front of our eyes, the door to the back porch just opened. This didn't make sense. The sliding lock that had kept it locked inside could only be opened by an adult as it was high up, far too high for us kids. But as we looked, we saw that the lock was unlocked, which couldn't have been right because the only remaining adult that had been back here was the guide, but we had watched him lock it and we saw no one else pass us, not to mention, like I said, it was an old creaky house and we didn't hear any sounds of footsteps behind us before we heard the door begin to move. The guide noticed us peeking at it and walked up behind us and frowned. That's not supposed to be open, he said. I asked him why it was open and he said, another group must have come by, but he obviously did not sound very sure. 
I overheard him say to a teacher that the door was heavy and hard to open at times. Meaning if someone had opened it, we should have heard more noise than we had. Not just a couple of strange creaking noises. When we were done, I rushed back to the bus with the other children, confused and creeped out, ready to leave this place. The other kids, upon being told what happened, said that they did it, but with the mean smiles on their faces and with multiple people claiming they had done it themselves, I think they were just trying to tease us. This really freaked me out when I was a kid, and I'm still very convinced that the paranormal is real. But what would you expect, living in a town like that with a lot of Civil War history, a lot of bad blood and trauma over the years? To me, I think the town has its own memories, and I think sometimes those memories replay in our reality. But that doesn't mean it's any less disturbing. Stay out of Guam. From Oside Guy 760. I lived in Guam for some time, knowing the history and the island's culture, being that it was a key point in World War II. There's going to be some crazy stories of unexplainable events there. I have two of my own that still get under my skin to this very day. The first one was when I was hanging out with my family in Jigo. After practicing for the upcoming show in Chomoto Village, my cousins and I decided to walk up and down the street, just messing around. At this moment, I thought it would be a good idea to pull my iPod out and try out this ghost detection app that shows where ghosts and spirits are nearby and would even produce words that they're supposed to be saying something that I thought was just a fake gimmick. During this time, we figured we'd give it a go. One of my cousins asks, is there anyone with us that would like to talk? My iPod goes off with three red dots near us, and the word yes appears. Now feeling giddy, I ask the next question. Are you a man or a woman? Then it goes off again, saying two men, one girl. I laugh. One of my cousin's friend asks the next question. Where'd you come from? It replied with, behind house in jungle. Now, anyone that knows the locals will tell you to stay out of the jungle at night and to always ask permission before you enter the jungle where the Tao Tao Mona spirits live. Considering how accurate the words that were replied through the app were, I was beginning to feel weirded out because either this app really worked or it was using my location and responding directly to what I said, something I did not expect from an app this cheap looking. Story two happened down south in the village of Agat. I was with my girlfriend, now wife of eight years now. We were walking from one of the mom and pop stores. In the back, we passed by the cemetery where her mother was buried, and I asked her, hey, you wanna stop to at least say something to your mom before we head home? She shakes her head and says that we can do it tomorrow. I shrug and say okay. Now, I have never seen any pictures of her mother whatsoever when we were dating. Keep this in mind for the next part. Fast forward to the following morning and I wake her up, asking, Hey, I need to ask you something about your mom. It's going to sound very weird and I hope I don't upset you in any way. She gives me the go-ahead. This is the strange part. I ask her, was your mother buried in an all-white coffin and on the inside there are three diamonds and a rose in the middle? She turned pale. I kept going. Did she also have short hair and she... 
The other details elude me at the moment of her physical appearance, but needless to say, I was correct. My girlfriend begins to stammer a bit and says yes. I let her know how I know all this. It's because I had a dream the night prior. She tells me that we should have stopped to say something to her last night and that she was probably visiting us either to say hello or to express her frustration with us skipping out on a visit. If you ever come to visit Guam, stay out unless you fully understand that you may encounter some restless spirits, some good, some bad, and some especially creepy. Guam is a beautiful place, but it has a troubling past. The House and the Cabin from Kaiju Arcadia. When I was 14 years old, me and my girlfriend went to my grandparents' house. We agreed to actually do a test of courage in the middle of the night, an excuse to go explore some abandoned and creepy places. We asked my grandpa if he knew of any places like that. He told us about an old abandoned house and cabin at least a kilometer south of where we were. He said that the house was owned by a man from Ohio named Derek Shod from the 1900s, but he suddenly disappeared and was never heard from again. We were skeptic of this story. My girlfriend and I weren't very strong believers of these kinds of things, so we decided to go to that location, not entirely spooked by that story. My grandparents didn't want us to go, but like teenagers, we disobeyed. We ended up sneaking away and running off in the middle of the night, searching for that house and cabin to the south. The only thing we had on us were two knives, two flashlights, and a few extra batteries. As we were searching, I could feel that the forest had eyes and ears. The entire way through, it was like someone was following us, watching us closely. When we finally found the house and cabin, a sudden cold breeze blew, giving us chills straight up our backs. We entered the house first. We found a lot of creepy things, like books about demons and witchcraft, strange graffiti that we didn't understand, some very weird paintings, and worst of all, at least to me, a bunch of dolls in every room we entered. The house was only a common American house. That's the way I'd describe it, as I'm from the Philippines. We were scared now, but we were still ready to see that cabin. So we exited the house and cautiously made our way over to the wooden cabin. It was about 50 or 60 feet away from the house. While I was walking behind my girlfriend, I heard a strange voice. Over here. I'm here. I stop right then and there, looking around, trying to find what called me. All I saw was a small bulge of cement. I approached it and then just stopped. I couldn't help myself but stop at that position. All I remember after that was complete blackness. Apparently, I blacked out. When I woke up, I saw my girlfriend also lying face down on the ground, just outside the cabin. We never made it to it. I panicked a bit and approached my girlfriend. When she woke up, she screamed, scaring me. Leave us alone. I was surprised, and I took a step back. I asked what was wrong, and she said that a man had been following us from the very beginning. What? I looked at her face and saw how pale she was. She looked very frail and sickly. With us scared and now possibly in danger, I gave her a piggyback ride and carried her out of the forest as far as I could. 
we soon made it to the dirt road near my grandparents' house. When I put her down, I saw that no time had passed since we had first entered the forest. When we left, it was 11.38, but when we came back out of the forest, it was only 11.39. A single minute had passed, despite us walking over a kilometer back and forth. I called my uncle to come pick us up. A few minutes later, he showed up, and we rushed my girlfriend to the nearest hospital. When I told my uncle about our adventure, he got pissed and shouted that we were very, very lucky to come back alive. He said that some other people had tried to investigate that place, but many were hurt when they returned. Unfortunately, my friend actually got a permanent scar from the damage on her head after blacking out. We didn't do anything like this again for several years. Luckily, we're both alive and well now, but we won't be going back to any strange cabins. There's a demon in Lake Park. From Brett4798. When I was 16 years old, I started seeing more and more paranormal things. It was as if I was targeted to be tormented by demons and spirits. My grandpa once told me that it was a curse that ran in the family. I was never sure that I believed all that until one night. It was a Friday night in January. We lived in a small town and there wasn't much to do. So as usual, I sat in my room on my phone, waiting for someone to ask me to hang out with them, waiting for myself to come up with a better idea if that didn't happen. After a while, I got a text from my friend, Jerry. The text read, Hey man, let's get spooky tonight. I knew exactly what he meant. He wanted to get in his old truck and drive around on creepy roads. I was bored out of my mind, so naturally I said yes to him. I got dressed real quick, then got in my car. It wasn't long after that that I met Jerry and some other friends at my friend Cam's house. We sat around for a while, talking about Lake Park that's a few miles outside of town remembering the urban legends about it while we waited for my girlfriend at the time to show up. The most well-known legend about Lake Park was something about a guy taking, tormenting, and ending the lives of random girls. They say he preyed upon them at Lake Park a long time ago. Now let me get to the good part. The truck was full and my friend Jerry was driving with Tommy in the passenger seat. In the back seat was me, my girlfriend Maddie, and another girl named Mary. We drove down the path that goes to the back of the park. We drove under this light pole that supposedly was out of order and didn't receive power anymore. But the moment we passed under it, the light clicked on. Seconds later, the light went off, as if something or someone had turned the light on just for us. It was really strange. I wrote it off as maybe some malfunctioning motion detector, and maybe they didn't get around to uninstalling the power to that unit. I don't know. We slowed down and rolled down the windows after that, beginning to listen to the sounds around us. Sure enough, it wasn't long until we started to hear some strange noises coming from the forest around us. I was expecting something creepy to happen, sure, but what I did not expect was the amalgamation of screams in the distance. Feminine screams. Our little group got freaked out and tried to blame this on distant animals that just sounded like screaming but I didn't believe that. Not in the slightest. 
Our friend Mary then suddenly screamed, saying that she saw something in a tree. But no one else saw it, and perhaps besides me, no one else believed her. As we continued our drive, I turned around and focused my attention on the trees. To my horror, I saw exactly what she had described. A dark outline of a decaying body hanging from its neck from a large tree limb. I shouted out what I saw to the group, and Jerry stopped the truck. As we peered out the windows, we all were filled with this same awful feeling of absolute terror and dread. We continued to look and listen, but we didn't dare get out of the truck. It was too quiet, almost silent. But then, I heard what sounded like a faint whisper, a child's voice saying, Help. When I turned to the direction of the noise, I saw where it came from. There was a pale-skinned little girl dressed in tattered gray clothes. She was about 20 feet away from the truck. I stared on in shock for maybe 10 seconds, but then she vanished. After a couple of breathless moments, I regained my composure and told the group about what I saw. Mary started to record the forest around us on her phone, which, oddly enough, immediately cramped out. Soon enough, my attention was stolen by something behind a tree 15 yards away from us. I could only describe it as a phantom-like shadow. It had the body of a man and stood about eight feet tall. Its eyes were deep, dark red, you could see goat-like horns on top of its head. Everyone saw it. For some strange reason, though, that still wasn't enough to scare us away. Maybe we were gluttons for fear. So we kept watching it, as it would disappear for several minutes, then we would spot it again for only a few seconds. We eventually noticed that it was getting closer to our truck, then I saw it right behind the truck through the mirror, and I literally screamed to Jerry, Man, get us the hell out of here! As he started the truck, I could hear from behind us a deep and sinister voice. Stay. He floored it then. Gravel flying out behind us as we went up the path, leaving the park behind us as quickly as we could. We must have been going 75 down that old crappy country road. I'm surprised we didn't wreck. It was then that my friend Mary announced to us that she wasn't able to record any of that. I sighed. What we experienced could have been world-changing. After we all made it back to Cam's house, we got in our separate vehicles and left. Only then, on my way back home, did I feel relieved and safe again. I had to take my girlfriend home first. She lived in a town about 30 minutes away. When we departed from Cam's house, it was 11.30. When we got into my little Toyota truck, she sat in the seat and passed out immediately. It had been a long night, after all. I did try to shake her out of it to wake her up and give me company throughout the long ride, but nothing I did could make her move at all. I went ahead and started the car, driving our way to her house. If she was still unflinchingly asleep by then, I would just carry her inside. As soon as we got out of town, I was able to wake her up at last, but when she woke up, she acted like she had no idea what was going on. She even had an expression of sheer terror on her face. Then her eyes did something weird. They sort of rolled back in her head. Then she immediately passed out again. I was beyond concerned at witnessing this. I stopped the car and tried repeatedly to get her up. 
Then she suddenly started twitching and convulsing, which got worse and worse. I thought she was having a seizure. I screamed and shook her and did everything I could, but she wouldn't budge. Then she stopped moving and went silent. After a minute or so, she began mumbling something that I could not understand, something that sounded almost as if it were a different language. She said it in a deep and sinister, gravelly voice. Then as I made the connection in my head, my heart began to sink. It sounded like the same voice that told me to stay earlier. I continued to drive, now speeding the remaining 30 miles as I was scared to death. When we got into her town, she finally snapped out of it. She had no memory of this either. She didn't have any memory of anything since we had left the park. She started rubbing her leg and saying that it stung like crazy. Soon enough, I pulled into her driveway and turned on the dome lights to get a better look. When she rolled up her pant leg, I saw three scratches. It looked like she was scratched by a person with disgustingly long fingernails. When I looked closely at the scratches, they were scratched into what looked like a V-I, the Roman numeral for six. Now, I'm no biblical scholar, but I do know that six is the devil's number, and that scared me even more. Later that night, I went to my usual church to talk to the pastor, since his house was right next to the church. He didn't seem very happy that I woke him up at 12.30, but I didn't care, because I was scared, and I needed some answers. He told me that the things we witnessed in that park were an omen of great evil. That's what I already thought, but this served as confirmation. I called my friend Jerry, and the two of us went back to the park. We took one look around, just to be sure that we weren't all going crazy. Yet, plain in the day, in the middle of the park, out in the open, I saw it again, those red eyes piercing me, followed by another monstrous growl. We left right away. Lately, it's been pretty quiet at that park. I've driven by it several times, yet nothing more has happened. But that experience back then, it scared me pretty bad. And to this very day, I'll never go back to that park alone. They call it Ye Nod Lucii. From Leto Smith. Let me begin by saying this is a very real event. It seems like everyone starts off their stories like this, but I do feel the need to put that there. Because you need to take this story as a warning. I still don't exactly know what was really out there in those woods with me that night. Where I live, there's a rather large forest surrounding our home. That forest turns rather sinister when you understand that my family has had several paranormal experiences there. Both my mother and her brother have seen and heard inhuman things out there. The most terrifying experience was when my uncle heard my mother screaming for his help in the trees. When my uncle rushed to her aid, he found no one there. On another occasion, he heard the screaming of my father in the forest, but by then he knew that it wasn't actually my father. My uncle is quite familiar with the Native American legends and lore, and for a long time now, he has believed wholeheartedly 
and the legend of the Skinwalkers, or Yi Naldlushii. On the occasion that he heard my mother in the woods and ran out, he realized his mistake quickly and left the forest, but not before witnessing a dark and shadowy figure leaning on the tree nearby with yellow eyes staring at him. When I was a teenager, I went into those woods with friends in the dark to camp, or as we called it, get drunk in nature. On one occasion, my friends and I decided to take the truck into the woods that night. My friend Jody had Greg and David load the keg into the back, and once everyone was settled, I drove my truck into the woods. Now the trails and paths here were all green and kind of overgrown, because nobody really drove down them. At one point, I let David drive, because he was better at it, and I was too afraid of popping a tire on something. So I settled into the back beside Jody, and we started to talk about some gossip. After what seemed like only a few minutes, we pulled into the clearing. The one David and Greg swore up and down was perfect and safe for camping. David managed to get the keg out of the truck. Jody and I went to gather some dry grass and twigs for kindling for the fire. We were only armed with our phone flashlights, and Jody had a hunting knife that she'd brought along with her. The woods were so quiet and eerie that day. I was at Jody's side the entire time. Out of nowhere, I saw a flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye. I yelped and clung to Jody. What happened? She asked. I explained to her the shadowy thing that I saw out of the corner of my eye. Well, it's the woods, duh. You're going to see some things moving out of the corner of your eye. But if you're really scared, don't worry. I'll protect you. I trusted Jody, and I admired her confidence. We continued to gather the dry brush and twigs. Once we had enough, we brought it back to the boys. They managed to get a small fire going, and with the kindling we had brought, we were able to build that up into an actual campfire. Like any teens would, we gorged ourselves with beer and pizza, and of course, s'mores. After that, we sat back and relaxed in our chairs, which encircled the campfire, keeping us warm and toasty. We all sat together drinking and eating. After a few hours, David was the first of us to get up. I need to go take a leak. I'll be back in a moment. He let us know. Then he drunkenly stumbled into the woods, just out of sight so we couldn't see him. We all chatted and waited for him to come back. After about ten minutes, we were beginning to worry. I'll go and check on him. You two stay here, Greg said, walking to where David disappeared. Uh, he probably tripped or something. Probably too drunk to get up. Be careful, I called out to him, with me and Jody still next to the campfire. We didn't talk much as we waited for the guys to return. After all, we were both kind of creeped out and worried that something may have happened to David. When the two boys sauntered back to where the light was, I was so relieved. So what's going on? I asked. This idiot fell down. He ended up wandering really far into the woods. Greg answered with a shrug, sitting back down and grabbing his cup of beer. Yeah, but I... I could have sworn I heard Jody calling my name out there. David said, forcing my blood to run cold. He had a look of fear and confusion on his face. I think we should go. I sat up, letting everyone know what I thought about this. My friends looked confused at this. Look, I know it's crazy, but my uncle used to talk about things out there. But I don't think we're safe. I was begging for them to listen to me, but it was like whatever was in those woods with us understood what I was trying to do because the sound of a cracking tree branch made us all look over to the left. But what about the keg? Greg asked, and I shrugged. That didn't really matter now. 
Greg, come on. We need to get out of here. I continued to beg. I wanted to leave immediately, get out of that forest as soon as possible. The next thing that happened will honestly stay with me for the rest of my life. Sometimes I even still have nightmares about it. This was all five years ago, but it feels like yesterday. Another branch broke, and this time something stepped into the clearing with us something that only barely resembled a wolf. Our group jumped and gathered up. I was behind Jody, who was behind David and Greg. Even though I was behind the three of them, I still had a clear view of the creature, and I didn't feel the least bit safe. I knew immediately that something was wrong, because this forest did not have wolves, certainly not one of that size. The thing was eye to eye with David, and he was six foot one. He was the tallest of the four of us. We need to get to the car, he muttered without turning to us. He seemed not to want to make any sudden movements. Smart move on his part. Leave. I nearly fell back at the sound of it. That voice, it had come from the wolf. That's impossible. I let out a terrified scream. All common sense was out the window as we rushed from the clearing and over to the car. I unlocked the door. Greg jumped into the driver's seat and David sat beside him. Jody and I crawled into the back, Jody clutching the hunter's knife close. Greg started the car. We sped down the narrow grassy path. The small campsite disappeared from the rear view very quickly, and we all thought we were safe. We all thought it was over, until we saw those yellow eyes peering at us through the window. I screamed, burying my face into the neck of Jody, afraid that we weren't going to make it back alive. Greg was driving nearly 60 miles per hour, which was already terrifying enough on this small and thin path. But this thing was not affected by the speed we were going. Either it was stuck to us, or it was somehow keeping up with that pace. David kept his eyes on the thing the entire time. He swears to this day that he saw that wolf-like creature smile at him before disappearing. David and Greg could never identify the point where the wolf skinwalker disappeared, but it was gone out of nowhere suddenly. Greg continued to floor it out of the forest. Jody set me up in my seat and reassured me that it was okay. Though the thing that haunts me the most is that I saw the same thing my uncle did, I honestly believe those yellow eyes were the same one he saw that day though what he saw was more of a deformed man, but what I saw was more of a deformed wolf, I have a feeling that this thing changes shape, which would perfectly match the legends of Ye Nod Lushii. To this day, I think it was a skinwalker. The friends that I had that were there still don't talk about this event much. My father ended up having to be the one to go back the next day, to retrieve the keg and other things, and to make sure the fire was completely out. He came back home with the keg completely fine. Later that night, we talked about the event. He told me that he felt as if he was being watched when he was in the woods, and telling only me, he said that he saw those yellow eyes for himself as he drove back down the narrow grass path. After all these years, I still think about the event every day. It has caused me major anxiety and paranoia. The least I can say is that my friends all witnessed it with me, and though we don't talk about it, we all know and silently agree that it really happened.
Creature in the Woods from Twilight Dreamer 87. I was a 24 year old girl. I had a friend named Teresa who owned a house in Texas that was surrounded by woods. There are houses on the outside of those woods, but they're not very close to this house. She lived there with her husband and three kids for about five years and never once had any issues. Her husband worked out of town a lot, and when the kids were at school, she'd be alone most of the day since she was a stay-at-home mom. The house sat on 10 acres or so. It had a small pond and a creek that ran all the way through the center and into the woods. When she first moved in, she and I used to walk around through the woods and around the creek, talking and enjoying the scenery. It was always beautiful, always relaxing, so we made this a tradition until we ran out of new places to explore. After a while, she took in a rescue dog, a beautiful one-year-old boxer named Allie. Allie was shy at first, but she warmed up to Teresa and the kids, who were nine, 10, and 18 years old. Allie became protective of her new family. She knew who was friendly and who was a stranger. She didn't really bark at animals, but there were times when another random dog would show up and she would assert her dominance as expected, letting them know it was her territory. She never attacked or seemed aggressive towards me or anyone really. You could often find her in the garage on her bed. She did not like going inside much and enjoyed rolling around in the grass when the sun was out. They'd ask me to house sit for them a few days as they wanted to take the kids on vacation for the summer to a water park about six hours away. Of course, I said yes. I loved their place. It was gorgeous and had big eight foot tall windows all around it. I did ask if I could have someone stay with me though, as I hated being alone anywhere and they didn't mind. I asked my boyfriend and sister and they agreed. The day came a Saturday and my boyfriend and I loaded up our bags and headed to Teresa's house. We made plans to hang out and fish by the pond. We took advantage of their four-wheelers and rode them around in the woods. Teresa's husband and a few of his friends made a few mud holes and hills in a small area, so we definitely got dirty. I'm a country girl, so fishing and riding through mud is my kind of fun. We arrived as they were loading up their truck, kids running around, getting excited and ready to go. I saw Allie sitting in the garage and asked if she would be staying. Teresa said yes. Allie tended to get car sick, so taking her along would be a bad idea. I didn't mind, so I went over to pet Allie and I played with her a bit. My boyfriend talked with her husband for a while, asking about the four-wheelers, the do's and don'ts, and instructions for feeding Allie. We bid our goodbyes and they headed off down the road. My sister would show up the next day since she had to work that night and couldn't make it. The rest of the day went by smoothly. We enjoyed fishing for a time, drinking a few beers and chatting it up. Allie joined us and would jump after the lure when we would cast it out and eventually just laid on the ground next to me, falling asleep. At one point, I noticed her poke her head up, staring off into the distance, but she didn't make a sound. The pond is to the left of the house, but somewhat in front, while the opening of the creek is even further left, leading into the woods. This is where she was looking. At this point, it was starting to darken outside, and I couldn't really see what she was looking at exactly. About half an hour later, we decided it was time to go inside, so we began cleaning up the fishing poles and picking up our tackle boxes, loading them back into the truck. I suddenly heard a rustling in the woods next to us, making me jump. There are lots of deer around these parts, so I figured one was nearby and we startled it when we were beginning to move around. We headed back to the house with our gear. Allie had already run back on her own. 
The room we stayed in had its own bathroom, and it was huge. Windows all the way around. The shower was stunning, and we even had our own jacuzzi bathtub and two walk-in closets. As there were no other houses around, I immediately undressed without a worry and climbed into the shower. My boyfriend was cooking in the kitchen, and I could smell it all the way up to the bathroom. It smelled amazing. I didn't realize I was so hungry at the time, so I hurried and finished up, climbing out and grabbing a towel to dry off. As I patted myself down, I heard a growling sound coming from near one of the windows. I looked up at each window, but I could not see anything, so I walked a little closer. All I could see then was my own reflection, though. The sound came again. It kind of freaked me out, but then I remembered Allie. I smiled and assumed it was her, so I rushed to finish getting dressed, then ran into the kitchen. I told my boyfriend about it, but he said it was probably Allie growling at a rodent or something. We ate, watched a movie, and decided to head to bed as it was already midnight, and we wanted to get an early start the next day. I fell asleep rather quickly, which isn't the norm for me at all, but I was awakened by a sound that scared the hell out of me. At around 2 a.m., I heard the growling again. This time, it was deeper, angrier than before. I slowly reached over to try and wake my boyfriend, but he just wouldn't wake up. He's a heavy sleeper. I laid there listening, and I could hear something walking around outside, but this room had blinds, so I couldn't see anything. I got up and walked over to a window, still hearing those footsteps, but it didn't sound like Allie. It sounded bigger. I peeked out through the blinds, and I could faintly make out a figure in the shape of a dog, or at least something similar. And I knew then that it wasn't Allie. You see, Allie is white and tan, so I would have been able to see the white part of her at least, but this thing was covered in darker fur. Scared, I ran back to the bed and laid there until eventually I fell asleep. The next day, I told my boyfriend about what happened, and he laughed it off, saying I must have been dreaming. I couldn't help it and argued back that he needed to take me seriously and stop making fun of me, because I was for real scared. But this only pissed him off at me, so he left to go ride one of the four-wheelers. I begged him not to leave me alone there, because I didn't feel alone at this house. A few hours later, he finally comes back. We have a late lunch together and go to the game room to play some pool. I told him I wanted to go for a ride, but he insisted that I stayed inside. Annoyed, I told him I was going to go play with Allie then. So I walk outside and feed her, waiting patiently for her to finish. I sit there and have a smoke, looking out over the land and see something moving in the trees. I'm staring intently, trying my hardest to make out the shape, but it's too far away. Just then, Allie perks up and looks in the same direction, beginning to growl. Knowing how she is and seeing her hair stand up, I slowly stand, watch her, and start walking toward the door. She's growling louder as I run inside and call for my boyfriend, telling him to come out quickly. When he gets outside, Allie has run toward the creature at this point, and I start to yell for her to come back. Once we get to the end of the driveway, we can hear Allie barking like mad. We're looking in the direction the barking's coming from, and we see this creepy-looking thing standing a few feet away from Allie. It's too far away to make out too many details, but we can tell it's hairless, and it's dark gray with an almost black skin tone. It wasn't fur I was seeing the night before, but rubbery skin. I jump in the truck as my boyfriend floors it towards Allie and this creature. By the time we get there, Allie has this thing in the creek, so we run over to see what it is. My boyfriend keeps a gun in the truck at all times, 
and he has it loaded and ready. This creature, it looked like a hairless dog, but way bigger. It had fangs two to three inches long that stuck outside of its mouth, even when its mouth was closed. It had dark gray, leather-like skin with a few patches of thin hair on its body. It was pressed up against the wall of the creek, growling, teeth bared. Its eyes were as black as the night, and it had blood on its leg. I'm thinking Ali had attacked it. The whole time we stand there in shock at what we're seeing, not moving, not making a sound, just watching it and Ali. When it moved towards Ali, my boyfriend shot it twice. It yelled out in a strange and creepy yelp, then fell into the water. Allie backed up, letting my boyfriend get closer to the thing. I screamed and told him not to get too close. I got on the phone quickly to call animal control, and the police too, to come get this thing. An hour or so later after the police and animal control came and took the creature, we had calmed down a bit. I went out to check on Allie and realized she had blood on her neck. I put on some gloves to check her out, noticing two deep puncture wounds on her neck. I had to call an emergency vet and I explained our weird and creepy situation. He said I needed to contact animal control first. I called Teresa earlier and filled her in on the situation. She said they'd be back the next day and that I could leave the house, but I needed to take Allie with me. Once I contacted animal control again and told them of Allie, they came back and picked her up, stating that if the creature was diseased, she would need treatment immediately. We promptly left after Allie was picked up. We were not staying there in that house alone. About two weeks passed before I heard from Teresa again. I had called her several times before, desperate for an update about Allie, but no one ever gave her one, so I decided to call them myself. They told me that it was just a dog with rabies and that Allie was being treated for it. Bullcrap. There's no way whatsoever that that's what we saw that night. That was no dog. That wasn't rabies. There aren't dogs with three-inch fangs. No freaking way. When I began asking questions beyond that, they told me to contact the police instead if I wanted a better answer. But when I did that, the police acted like I didn't know what I was talking about saying the case number I gave them just didn't show up in the database. The officers that had come out there supposedly did not even work there and never had, despite me writing down their badge numbers. I couldn't believe it. They had to be kidding me. They're obviously hiding something, something they don't want us to know about. There's something in the woods here in Texas and we're not supposed to know about it. Allie came home a couple of days later, but she was different. She was more aggressive. She was growling at Teresa and the kids. They all became afraid of her, until one day they too had to call animal control. Allie had to be put down that night. She had bitten the animal control officer when he stepped out of his truck, Something happened to Allie, and it wasn't rabies. But no one will tell us what the hell is going on. If you live in Texas, if you live close to the woods, keep an eye on your children and your pets, because even if the things we don't understand don't even attack them, they're still in danger. And so are you. Living on the countryside, 
or even just living out of the way of other people. It can be so nice and relaxing. But what happens when it's not people who encroach on your land, but something of your worst nightmares? A subscriber by the alias of Bouncing Brick shares a terrifying ongoing experience with us because they don't go near the field at night anymore, as doing so may just cost them their life. I've had a number of strange experiences since I moved to the country in central Wisconsin, but this one is by far the most terrifying. This place used to be an operating farm. We are surrounded by fields and woods. Across the road to the east is a large field where I used to go to get good views of the night sky. There are old barns and sheds in the yard that my landlord just uses for storage now. The biggest barn, the one in the northeast quadrant of the yard, has always given me the creeps, especially at night. All of us just naturally avoid going near it, even during the day. Between the barn and the road to the east, there's a fair amount of clear lawn, but it's just an unspoken rule that we don't go over there unless absolutely necessary, because it just feels wrong. This first experience wasn't as bad, but I feel it's important to mention as it's likely that it is connected to the next one. It was the middle of the 2017 winter, and I had just gotten home from Taekwondo. It was only about 8 or 9 p.m. I stepped out of my car and opened the back door to grab my school stuff, along with my sparring gear. At first, I thought everything was normal, until I heard a sound. It was like a ticking-ish sound which I assumed was fine because my car made that noise while cooling off all the time. But then I realized that this ticking sound was not coming from my car and it began to pick up pace. It quickly turned into what sounded like a growl. It was coming from the far side of that barn, the creepy old barn. Then it became snarling Needless to say, fearing for my safety, I dropped everything, slammed the car door, and bolted inside the house. Now, we have coyotes and foxes around here, but they stay far, far away from any houses. Well, usually. But that growl, it was way too deep and loud to be a coyote. Even still, I tried my best to convince myself that that's all it was. Now, on to the following summer. I'd gotten myself a telescope for Christmas, since nothing excites me more than astronomy, and I brought a friend over so we could use it to look at some nebulae and maybe even the four planets that were supposed to be visible that night. The sky was clear, and it was the perfect temperature for some observations. It was about 10 or 11 o'clock, First, we took the telescope into the backyard, but we could not get a good view of Mars from there due to the nearby tree cover. So we decided to go to the east field across the street. It was free of trees over there, and as I said earlier, offered an amazing view of the sky. I picked up the telescope, and my friend went ahead of me, watching for dog piles in the yard so I wouldn't step in a pile of yuck. We walked up the driveway towards the road. Halfway across the road, we began to hear something that made us stop in our tracks. It was this demented mix between a growl, a hiss, and a snarl. It was coming from the ditch nearby. This sound made me jump backwards with the telescope still in my arms. My friend cursed under her breath before dashing back a few meters. I was frozen in the middle of the road, staring at the spot where the sound had originated from. She grabbed my arm, saying, Go, 
Start walking. I'll watch your back. Her grip on my arm was so tight, it snapped me out of my trance. Steadily, I turned back toward the house, speed walking as fast as possible now without dropping the telescope. Halfway down the driveway, I heard my friend harshly whisper, Oh my god, Alaric, there are eyes there. I see eyes in that ditch. I paused at this to look over my shoulder and see what she was talking about. And sure enough, there were eyes reflecting a yellowish silver staring at us from that ditch. We got inside safely and shut the curtains. We did not want to see what that thing actually was. That field is long and near the far end, it slopes downward pretty drastically. I've been out there enough times to know this pretty well. Anyway, that night I had to take my friend home. But as you could probably guess, we did not want to leave the house again. As we ran at full speed to my car, she stayed behind me, clutching tightly to my sweater, which is extremely uncharacteristic of her. She was almost as petrified as I was. As I turned my car around in the driveway, she said it again. Those eyes are out there. It's still watching us. As I neared the edge of the driveway... I saw what she was talking about. Farther back in the field, those same eyes, somehow brighter than before, were looking back at us. I stopped the car at the end of the driveway as it continued to stare us down. The creature was far back in that field. Based on the sloping of the field and just how high above the ground the eyes appeared, this creature was eight or nine feet from the ground, and as there was nothing to climb on there, this animal, this monster, was tall, with unrealistically large yellow-silver eyes. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen. As we stared at it, the eyes quickly lowered. It only took us a few seconds to see that the creature was coming closer to us, as I hit the gas, we saw the way its eyes moved. They moved in a figure eight pattern, the way something does if it's lumbering on two large legs. That gait of a massive weight shifting left, then right, as it approached. I had never been so afraid at my own home. We floored it out of the driveway. I took my friend home and I didn't come back home myself until daylight. What's worse about this is that later on when it began to snow, I started to find huge footprints in the snow near my house. These prints are definitely not human. They're way bigger than human prints would be, and they do not match the prints of any animal that I've seen. Just the other night, I saw those prints near our barn. They walked across the driveway, and they stopped near my front door before going back the way they came. Every time I come home at night, I find myself repeating a mantra of, please don't see it, please don't let me see it, while obsessively watching staring at the field. I never want to see this thing's face, but those prints are getting closer every day. I feel like I'm going to have to see it soon, whether I like it or not. Needless to say, I do not go near my field at night anymore. The remaining stories are creepypasta. Enjoy, and don't forget to like and share this episode. 
Thank you. You've probably played games with procedurally generated levels. You've probably even heard some procedurally generated music playing in the background of your favorite films or video games. We've been on the precipice of an AI-generated world for some time now, but I think I've crossed the point of no return. I've got a master's in computer science, as well as a master's in artificial intelligence. Unfortunately, I was unable to employ this knowledge, as once I graduated, I had to start work in a massive office building as a call operator. Our job was to call leads, who were people who may or may not, mostly not, be interested in a product we helped third parties sell. It required no previous skill or education. It felt like a waste of my time, but I had to do it. Student loans sort of swallow your whole life like that, swallow your dreams away always working away your time to pay back the people who promised to help you get a real career. But that's life, I guess. I worked 44 hours a week, as we had an odd four-hour Saturday every week. I was always exhausted, always denied my few friends' requests to hang out. I was in a terrible way. My life did not turn out how I wanted it to. It was after a night of binge drinking that I realized I had everything I needed to make my dreams real, even if I didn't get paid in the meantime. I could become an inventor of something never seen or done before. Computer procedurally generated data was something I did a thesis on. I'd always believed it would be our future. In some far off year, you could walk up to a computer interface when you're hungry, and the computer would read what you crave most, coming up with something that possibly isn't even a known dish, but it matched your desires to the T. With artificial intelligence, anything is possible. A smart enough algorithm can become as creative, or more creative, than any person. So why did I settle on movies? Well, I'm a big fan of horror films. The best movie ever made, in my opinion, was John Carpenter's The Thing. So outwardly horrifying, yet infinitely rewatchable, as you try to figure out who becomes a monster before it's revealed. I think I must have seen it a hundred times by the time I was 28. I kept thinking one night while sipping at a glass of whiskey, what if there was a software that took observations of your personality and created a 3D CGI movie that it knew you would enjoy? Wouldn't that be amazing? You get bored, you sit down at your computer, and you tell the software that you want to watch a movie. It sounded so good at the time. It sounded world-changing. And after three long years of secret development, it was ready to test. I had it installed on my desktop workstation, a computer that I'd invested $5,000 in over the past few years, so that it had all the power it needed for the software to work. I named my software Creation. Simple, maybe a bit edgy, but for the time it would work. With my glass of wine and a box of Cheez-Its, of all things, I sat down one evening after work and I double-clicked the icon. The black, borderless window opened up perfectly. The word creation was displayed at the top center discreetly. I had gone for a dark, minimal approach to it. It was time for me to make my first movie. Now, there were some problems, of course, with this limited software. After all, I could only do so much by myself and with a very, very limited budget. For one, when the movies were done, they would have no voice acting. One thing that AI will have a very difficult time replicating in the future is a realistic human voice. Secondly, it took approximately two and a half minutes for a single frame of a movie to render. So, with the typical 90-minute movie, filmed at a cinematic frame rate, 
it would take creation around seven to eight months to complete. So I had to compromise with my first film. I was too eager, too excited to wait that long just to see how a feature length film could turn out. I decided on making the film 45 minutes instead, short enough that I could wait for it, but long enough to have a decent feel of a real movie. That way I would know if creation made movies decently, but that would take about four months. But I reminded myself, with the last sip of wine, it would all be worth it in the end. I clicked the rounded rectangular button on the window that read Create, and an elapsed time window appeared. Approximate time to completion, 101 days. A bit shorter than I previously thought. Now you might be wondering how the software writes the film and what the software bases that writing on. Well, I took the shady approach. I taught the AI to read the user's computer. Search history, documents containing text, chat logs, online gaming records. It would attain data on any normal person's personality and could accurately guess your favorite film at a 96% success rate based on my own tests. And yeah, I even secretly installed the software on some coworkers' computers, allowing creation to read their data, and it would guess almost every one of them perfectly. I would later on ask that coworker what their favorite film was, and I would be astonished and quite proud when their answer matched creations. Now all there was to do was wait, and waiting was the hardest part. I found myself growing more and more irritated as the months went by, often snapping at coworkers when they tried to chat with me. I think I nearly got myself written up once when I rolled my eyes at my boss. In the end, though, it would be worth it. I told myself that every morning. My worst fear was that the power would go out and completely reset creation's progress, but luck was in my favor, or maybe it was misfortune. Creation finished rendering the movie seven days early. I was ecstatic. I drew the blinds, turned out most of my lights to set the mood, and even popped some popcorn. I immersed myself in the movie-watching setting. Then I opened the AVI file in the VLC application. Before I knew it, the movie, my movie, was playing right before my eyes. To my amazement, Creation had made herself her own opening credit, a minimal yet beautiful hand-drawn transition where an invisible hand drew each of the letters in Creation. I audibly laughed. There were tears in my eyes. Just seeing what Creation was capable of, it made me so incredibly confident in the movie yet to come. Soon, my own name flashed on the screen under the word inspired by and my giddiness grew. The black background then faded out, revealing a CGI wasteland. The detail of the textures was astounding. I felt then that every minute spent waiting for this film was worth it. Judging from the scenery and grunge lighting, I immediately assumed that Creation had set out to make a thriller, suspense, or even a horror film, though I hadn't specified but I'd have to wait and see to be sure. The camera jump cut to a close-up of the cracked, dried soil. Suddenly, red liquid spilled out over the soil, moistening it extremely realistically. Some of the liquid spilled into the cracks. I watched on the edge of my seat, unable to finish chewing the popcorn in my mouth. The camera slowly panned to the right, revealing a person's hands clawing at the ground. The red liquid continued to flow, and the camera panned until the source of the fluid was found. The person, a man, his throat was cut open in a deep gash, and an unending flow of red came pouring out. Holy crap, I said. I smiled wide, my mouth open wide. And then the camera jumped to a close-up of what I assumed to be the man's eyes. My stomach sank a bit. 
There was something familiar about them. I swallowed, finally, and ignored it, continuing to watch the movie. The camera began to pull away, widening the view and revealing the man's face. My hands were trembling, even as they held onto the sides of my chair so hard, the knuckles were white. What? I managed to say in a stammer. A perfect, hyper-realistic CGI rendering of my own face stared back at me from the screen. The man with the leaking wound was me, a 3D model of me, but it was so accurate that even the birthmark on the ridge of my nose was there. Struggling to breathe, I found myself fingering that birthmark, feeling for it as if I would find it stolen from my own face. It was still there, a perfect mirror of the mark on the CGI man's face. The man, who was apparently me, had a blank expression, even as he appeared to be on the verge of death. But when he began to smile, I jumped right out of my seat. No, this is... that's not even possible, I said. His front teeth, the incisors, they were slightly crooked on the right, exactly how mine were. How in the world would a software know what I looked like? How did it know my exact form down to my birthmark and the shape of my teeth? I did not have a webcam. I didn't have an actual camera in my house except the one on my cell phone. It was impossible. And I had never programmed creation to do something like that. I was panicking, heart pounding hard in my chest. I had to remind myself to breathe. But as I stared at the screen, I did not blink. The man suddenly stopped smiling as his mouth tore open at the sides. He screamed. Suddenly, his body began to destruct and change. Bones popped out of his skin, joints inverted. Teeth grew in places where there should never be teeth. His neck folded in on itself, forcing the skin tissue of the throat to tear at the strain. Underneath that neck skin, I was horrified to see another face. This one was far from human. I grabbed at my body as I watched my CGI self being torn asunder. My own joints and skin stung at the sight of myself being mangled. My stomach tightened, and I felt as if I might throw up. When his transformation was complete... The second face smiled like the first did before. Its teeth were razor sharp. There were rows upon rows of them. Then it spoke. I was petrified to hear my own voice coming from that creature. I do hope you're enjoying the movie. Was it talking to me? Another impossibility, it couldn't be. At the very most, it was a pre-rendered scene that Creation had placed in the film. But that would mean that Creation knew it was making a movie, and it knew that I would be watching. And somehow, it recreated my voice. Coming to my senses, I leapt at the desktop tower, clicking violently at the power button. Thankfully, the computer shut down just as it should, and soon I was left in my dimly lit room. My breathing was slow and shaky. My hands still trembled. I ended up spilling half the glass of water I had poured for myself as I tried to drink it. What had I created, and how had it gone so wrong? It made no sense. Creation rendered images that were too accurate. How had she gotten that information? I had never once admitted or took pictures of my birthmark or my teeth and stored them on my computer. And I didn't have social media. I used more anonymous services like Reddit and the occasional dive into 4chan. I tried to forget about it for the evening. I turned on all the lights in my apartment and tried to diffuse my horror with some cartoons. That night, I did not sleep easily. 
I had nightmare after nightmare, dreams of looking in the mirror and seeing that creature look back. Dreams of waking in the middle of the night to see another CGI version of me smiling from my closet. I woke up several hours early in the morning and I stayed up. It took me a few days to calm down enough to turn my desktop back on. Everything seemed normal. It booted up fine, my desktop was as it should be, and all my shortcuts were there. Even creation. I began to sweat a bit at the sight of her, but I had to open it again. I had to know if what happened the first time was a fluke, or if it was something more. I messed with the settings a bit first, requesting creation to make a movie for me that matched certain parameters. Genre, comedy. Runtime, four minutes. Realism, low. It was the polar opposite of the first movie, which I had long since placed into the recycle bin and deleted forever. I was determined, confident, that this time around nothing would go wrong. With these parameters, it absolutely couldn't. It would be impossible. As impossible as hearing my own voice and seeing my own face in a procedurally generated film. Ugh, I shuddered. Then clicked create. Approximate time to completion. Four days. I waited. This time, severe anxiety enveloped me rather than excitement. What would creation show me this time? The work week flew by, even though I wished they wouldn't. Suddenly, it was Saturday, and I had nothing to do. The time remaining for creation to finish rendering read two hours. I passed the time reading random news feeds, but I couldn't concentrate on a single headline. The next time I looked at the monitor... The render bar had disappeared. The movie was done. I shut my eyes hard and breathed in deep. Then I sat in my desk chair and opened the file. Like before, Creation had inserted the hand-drawn logo for herself with a black background. Then, as before, the black background began to fade away. I was starting to get jittery. The scene came into view. It was a top-down view of a guy sleeping in bed. He was in a funny position, with his hair a crazy mess and a snore that could wake the neighbors for miles. I was relieved. The first film really was just a fluke. His alarm then went off. He jumped up suddenly and turned to look at the alarm clock. Humorously, it read, late, then blinked and said, really late. I smiled. It had the comedic timing of a Pixar film. His mouth suddenly moved to express his panic. Of course, no actual voice came out. Creation could do sound effects like snoring and the music, but not voices. I was relaxing in my chair now. My muscles had stopped tensing up, and I was actually beginning to enjoy the short film. I was three minutes in, and the story unfolded. It was a simple story of a guy whose alarm clock had reset in a subtle power outage in the night. He kept imagining his apparently mean and loud boss being even more mean and loud than before. It was actually enjoyable. Until he arrived at work. My mouth slowly came open. That's... that's my office building. I whispered to no one but myself. The name of the company was the same. The shape of the building was the same. The main character even parked in the same spot that I parked every weekday. No. No, 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 no. I was begging, but my computer could not listen. The main character ran into work and quickly situated into his cubicle. A cubicle that not only sat in the same spot as my own, but it was also decorated the same. A picture of my recently deceased dog, one of those drinking bird toys, an ergonomic keyboard I had purchased at Best Buy that helped relieve stress from my wrists. Tears began to stream down my face, 
but I could not look away. The terror was an adhesive to my focus. When the main character sat down in his chair, he suddenly stood up, back stiffened, then slowly turned toward the camera. For the first time, he looked right at it. He was smiling. Suddenly, the video glitched. Artifacts and tears deranged the entire scene. Then the lights in my apartment began to flicker. I think I screamed, but I couldn't be sure. In my state of fear and insanity, I had clutched my head in my hands and pleaded for everything to stop. It was at that moment that I heard it. I do hope you're enjoying the movie. A whisper in my ear. A whisper in my own voice. When I turned to see my intruder, to see my own nightmare before me, I saw nothing. The light stayed on, and the desktop computer had crashed when I turned back around. Everything was normal again. I've been sitting in my room for hours. I don't know what to do. I'm torn. On one hand, I've created something that could change the entire entertainment world. But on the other, there's something wrong with it. Something terrible. Something that makes me think letting people use this software could only mean the worst. I still have creation on my computer, but I don't know if I will open her again. My nightmares are more frequent than ever, and I'm starting to think the one about the closet is more real than I choose to believe. As I type this, I can feel it burning into my scalp. I want so badly to pull the headset off, but I know exactly what will happen, and I don't think I can survive that again. When I first caught wind of the Oculus Rift, back when it was still just a Kickstarter campaign, my mind was blown. I had always dreamed as a kid of being able to step into my favorite video games, I daydreamed about saving the world, swinging the Master Sword with my own hands as Link. I visualized myself as a bored god, making sure my sim's needs were met, or even making their lives hell. The idea of being inside the world of a game, it sounded so far off, impossible. Yet, under two decades later, we were on the cusp of actual tangible VR. Sure, some people doubted it, called it fake VR, compared it to the failure of Nintendo's Virtual Boy headset. Some folks wouldn't even be happy until we had Sword Art Online levels of virtual reality. But I was satisfied simply with sight, sound, and the ability to move my arms and interact with the world more joyful than my own. Years later, VR has come a long way. We now have developers working on pixel-perfect limb movement, leg trackers, 360-degree treadmills. People are doing everything they can to make the VR experience even more real. But they have no idea that it's all pointless. Once you go too far down the rabbit hole, you get stuck in a cycle of hell. It all started when I attended a small VR expo in Chicago. With the promise of new, yet-to-be-released prototype headsets available to demo, I was guaranteed to attend. I was a VR nut now, so there was no missing something like this. The expo was thrilling. There was a new headset from a lesser-known Chinese phone company that had an insanely high resolution. The demo game looked nearly real, but you'd need a $3,000 gaming PC to run it at speeds that wouldn't make you nauseous. 
even the desktop that they had hooked up to the headset was struggling to meet 60 frames per second. And even that, for VR, can make you sick. Then my personal favorite was the headset that focused on field of view. They had managed to stretch the field of view to 180 degrees, which exceeds humans' horizontal field of view and meets our vertical field of view. The more you know. When I tried this one, I could see how people could nearly forget they're even wearing a headset. It felt like putting on a different pair of eyes. Sadly, the resolution suffered, and the screen door effect was so bad, you never felt immersed. I spent several hours making multiple rounds at the event, trying a multitude of spectacular devices. As the event was coming to a close, with 20 minutes left until the building closed its doors, I spotted a modest booth that I hadn't seen previously. Strange, I thought. By then, I'd made at least a dozen laps around the entire place, yet I hadn't seen this booth before. It consisted of a single black curtain with a plain black banner boasting white Times New Roman lettering that read, Conscious VR. I smirked. These VR titles were only getting more predictable. There was a man sitting there behind a cheap folding table, and in front of him was the boxiest looking headset I'd ever seen. Its goggles ended in jagged edges. The strap was loose and seemed to be made of a cheap material. It was beyond generic, reverting past basic. The man himself reflected the dismal headset. He was adorned with a plain white tee, a tired expression, and eyes that had glazed over hours ago. He looked bored. I walked over. 20 minutes was plenty of time to experience one more prototype. Conscious VR, huh? I said with a curious inflection. Mm-hmm. The man didn't even open his mouth. So, what's the gimmick? I pointed to the hefty headset. It's pretty big, so uh, does it have a crazy field of view? Super 8K resolution? Or is it an all-in-one or something? I knelt down and got a closer look. I didn't want to handle the thing until I got some sort of reaction from the guy. None of that, he muttered. Well, then what is it? I insisted. He paused for a moment, staring at me, then to the headset. Without looking back at me, he simply said, Wakes you up. I sneered. What's that supposed to mean? Like a cup of coffee? I mean, I could certainly believe that a VR game or device could be designed to get your blood pumping, so I wasn't too skeptical. Well, how tired are you? He asked, emotion still vacant in his words. I was getting impatient. Reaching my hands out to the headset, I looked toward the man. He nodded, granting me silent, though unenthusiastic, permission. The thing was heavier than it looked. It must have weighed 12 pounds at least. Immediately, I rolled my eyes. Whoever developed this wasted their time. Something this heavy would never be consumer or even commercially friendly. I grabbed the strap and stretched it over the back of my head. Then I laid the goggles on my forehead struggling to find a means to adjust the tightness of it around my head before I blinded myself with it. But I couldn't find anything. No way to tighten the straps and no knob to adjust the forward position of the goggles. Nothing. You'll need to hold it, I heard the man say seemingly seconds away from a deep yawn. Seriously? A headset you have to hold on to? There goes any hope of innovative or even enjoyable gameplay you could get out of it. With a sigh, I did as he instructed me. I held it at a position as comfortable as the awkward device would allow. The screen was black. Is it on? I asked. There was no reply. The sky was starting to piss me off. Is there a button I need to press? Still silence. Forget it. I wasn't going to stand there and be made a fool of by someone who should have been there to sell me on their idea. I yanked off the headset. 
I immediately fell backward onto the ground, breathless. Everything was black. In every direction, up, down, left, right, it was all blackness. A perfect dark that did not sway or falter. A black this flawless was unnatural, unnerving. I began to panic. I could feel my breathing speeding up and becoming more shallow. It was a struggle to pick myself back up and remain on two legs, as I could not see anything to balance myself with, no frame of reference. And when I was standing again, I attempted to look at my hands. There was nothing. I screamed, but the blackness seemed to swallow the sound, if there ever was a sound. I couldn't be sure. Was I blind? Was I deaf? Was I dead? Even though I could have sworn I already did, I kept reaching up to pull off the headset, but I felt nothing but my hair and skin. At least I was still there, I guess. Then the electricity came, a deep, sharp, stinging pain that ran through me from top to bottom like a bolt of lightning. This pain was so intense that all other thought left my mind, and though I could not see it, I felt the dribble of saliva flooding out of my mouth like some tased criminal suspect. When I woke up, my entire body was asleep, a thousand needles per square inch of flesh. My vision had returned and the headset was gone. I lay there in the floor of the event building alone. I sat up awkwardly, the needles slowly fading. My head was a mess of agony and confusion. The building was empty now. Had everyone left me there while packing up and leaving? Why would they do that? Had I passed out and no one cared? I picked myself up and carried myself to the glass front doors. For some reason, they weren't locked, and I was able to leave without a problem. Groggily, I made my way back to my hotel room. I had a plane to catch in the morning and I had no way of knowing what time it was because the numbers on my phone were too blurry to read. How I made it back to my hotel bed alive or at all was a surprise. I lay there, eyes closed, enjoying the comfort of thread counts higher than I had at home. I felt fine then, save for the remnants of a headache. I looked over to the digital clock on the nightstand. 2.17 a.m., the journey back to the hotel certainly didn't take more than half an hour, so I must have been unconscious for a while. Even so, I was extremely tired. I found it difficult to keep my eyelids open, and raising my arms was a skirmish against my own body. So, with some effort, I adjusted my pillow and shut my eyes. But sleep did not come. Something was keeping me up. At first, I thought it was the headache, but it soon became clear to me that the headache wasn't actually a headache. There was an ache above my ears, wrapping around the entirety of my scalp like a circle. I could feel something there, something that hurt the longer it remained on me. For a moment, I assumed that the heavy headset had left a sore spot around my entire head. Naturally, I reached up to feel the source of my discomfort, my eyes flew open and taut. They began to water, quickly swelling to a point where tears flowed down my face. What my fingers came into contact with was not a sore on my flesh, but cloth webbing. It was the same kind of material that that headset had been made of. I shot up and began to scour my own face with my hands, feeling immediately a bulky apparatus in front of my own eyes, in front of my own vision, and somehow I could not see it. Choking on my saliva, I yanked at the strap and clasped at the thing in front of my eyes, raising it above my head. In a sudden transition, the world around me changed. The hotel room disappeared as the apparatus came off of me. Around me instead was my own bedroom, my wife sleeping soundly at my side, though I recalled her having blonde hair, not auburn. The morning sun burned my retinas through the glass pane, 
though I recalled the window being at the opposite side of the room. Shivering, I looked down at my hands. Lying within their grasp set a jet black device. It wasn't the same as the conscious VR headset that I had expected. This was more sleek, quite a bit lighter, and with a more professional design sense applied to it. My eyes strained to open wider, ready to come apart at the seams. Honey, did you really wear that to bed? I turned sharply. My wife stretched herself awake and had greeted me with a reference to this device that I thought I'd never seen before until now. What? No, I... Speaking was difficult. My throat was dry and trembled even more than my exterior. You always wake up acting weird when you go to bed with that thing. I told you to stop doing that. It can't be good for your brain. She climbed out of bed with a yawn and made her way to the bathroom. Yet, I recalled the bathroom entrance being in the hallway. I took the moment to re-examine the headset. It looked typical. A strap, some adjustment knobs, some sort of softer-than-foam material applied to the inside of the goggles. If anything, it just seemed like a better quality version of the VR headsets that I remembered. But then I turned it about to see the lenses. There weren't any lenses. Rather, there in the middle of the top of the goggles set a metal connector, a dongle of some kind, similar in shape to a USB Type-C. My mouth was agape. I reached out, touching the connector. There was some sort of brownish-red residue on the side of it. Is that blood? Instinctively, my hand flew up to my forehead where the goggles would have met my face. A chill ran down my spine. My fingers met a hole, a small hole, that perfectly matched the shape of the dongle. I must have sat there, thoughtless and silent for a moment, because the next thing I knew, my wife stood nervously at the bathroom door in a robe. Henry? Henry, is it happening again? Eyes watering, my gaze slowly met hers. I failed to blink, and I swear for a brief moment, I forgot how to breathe. In a sort of shell shock, I watched my wife pick up her phone and dial an ambulance. I was taken to the hospital. An exasperated doctor looked over my eyes and forehead thoroughly with a minuscule flashlight. Henry, you were in here just last week. I told you to take a break from that headset. My mouth didn't budge. I had nothing to say. Mm, yes, okay. You see, your excessive use is now causing a blood leak. While not usually fatal, it can cause disorientation and even seizures. I stared down at my hands. For some reason, all I could do was listen and count my fingers. One, two, three, four. I want you to stay here tonight while we monitor your brain activity. Five, six, seven. Are you listening, Henry? We'll keep an eye on you. But when you leave in the next couple of days, promise me you take a break from that thing. And by God, don't go back to bed with it. Eight, nine, ten. The doctor spoke to my wife just outside the room. A nurse came in to apply some monitors to my heart and temples. She let me know that if I felt a seizure coming on, if I just didn't feel right, I simply needed to press this red button next to the bed. My wife came in then, kissed me, cried a bit, told me to get better. Then she left. That night... The hospital was quiet, but I lay awake, trying to figure this out. Was this reality? Had I come back to the real world from some sort of hyper-realistic escapism? And if this was the real world, why didn't I remember it? Sure, for the most part, my wife was the same. 
Our house was the same. The decorations were the same. The only big difference was the headset. I never remembered a headset like this existing. I didn't recall having surgery to implant an insertion point in my skull. This, this world was like the one I remembered, but only slightly different. My mind raced. I was beginning to wear myself down. Maybe I was overreacting to this. After all, if everything was essentially the same besides the technology of some weird headset, maybe I was worrying about nothing. I would just go home, live my life as usual, and stop worrying my wife by using that damned headset so much. Ah, I winced. My temples throbbed. It felt like they were sending some sort of current through these monitors. I reached up to fill them, and my heart seemed to stop. Webbing. A strap. Another headset that I could not see. Tremors flooded me as I lowered my hands. This time, I was too terrified to immediately rip off the apparatus. I was not prepared for another transition, another revelation showing me that not even this was real. I was still in yet another virtual world. I swallowed hard, but nothing went down. My throat was drier than ever. I didn't want to do it, but I knew I had to. If I didn't reach up and pull off this headset, I would only live on not knowing, living a lie. Steadily, one inch at a time, my hands moved in unison up to the straps that I was now fully aware of. These were thinner, yet somehow sturdier than the last. It came off more easily. I kept my eyes shut tight and only opened them slowly once the headset was off entirely. It took a moment for my eyes to adjust to the brightness of the room I was in. Once I came to, I could make out a large auditorium full of hundreds of people. Laughter, excitement, just plain positivity. If I had to guess, it was an expo, but a much larger one than the one I attended with the conscious VR booth. I quickly located a large banner toward the back of the hall that read, Welcome. Step into another world, 2019. What you think? An ecstatic voice nearly shouted in front of me. Huh? I managed to say. I looked ahead of me. I was holding the headset, which consisted of a thin white strap and a small rectangular box. A far cry from the goggle shape I was used to. The cubic is great, huh? It's the smallest extraneous world device on the market. The guy was short but built. He obviously took care of himself and was very excited about this product. Well, it's not on the market yet, but obviously we're gonna make some waves, right? Extraneous world? Is that what they called VR here? Once again, my breathing became troublesome and stressed. This world already seemed far more different compared to the last shift. People wore hairstyles that seemed out of place to me. Several other people walked around with IVs coming from stylized backpacks and implemented into their wrists. Like this world's version of vaping. A woman walked in with a species of animal that I did not recognize. Without a word, I handed the device back to him and walked away. I exited the event, searched for my wallet, and thankfully found a key card with my information to a hotel room. When I made it back to my room, I sat down at a rolling chair in front of a tiny wooden desk where a laptop lay. I opened it. I quickly scanned over the icons. Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, a classic RuneScape launcher. It was exactly the same as my original laptop. The brands were the same, the icon positions were the same, even the classic runescape played identically to what I remembered. My head collapsed into my hands as I sobbed. I wanted to scream, yet I sat convulsing in tears. Because it didn't matter that the differences still weren't major. 
because it didn't matter that I could probably pick up the phone and still hear from my very same loving wife. I cried because I had absolutely no idea what original actually meant anymore. I cried because as my face sat in the palm of my hands, in a puddle of my own tears, I could feel yet another set of webbing around my head, another strap, another headset, another fake world. I haven't shifted worlds again. I'm still in the last one, noticing more and more differences than I had before. That new Nintendo console I'd purchased a month ago, it hasn't released yet here. The Pomeranian puppy I bought my kid for their birthday, it's a German Shepherd now. But worst of all, I noticed the first major difference within one of these shifts when I flew back home. My daughter, our five-year-old little girl who had begged me for a puppy and a bunk bed so that her friends would have a place to sleep during sleepovers. She wasn't our daughter anymore. She was now a 14-year-old he. I still feel the same love and adoration as I did, but the effects this has had on my psyche only grow, even as I continue to ignore the ache of the strap around my head. It burns, it throbs, it stings every second of every day. I can feel the pain of it. I can feel it indenting itself into my flesh on the other side. Every sore sensation screams at me to pull the headset off, but I'm too afraid. I'm afraid because I know things will get different. My definition of real will only drift further away. I don't think I can handle it again. Even though I know beyond this headset, there will be another, and another, and yet another. And I'm afraid that with each removed headset, I place myself closer to a more hellish reality. A reality closer to the truth. A reality where my da- I mean, son, doesn't actually exist. A reality where I'm alone, bedridden, diseased, paralyzed, or worse. Maybe a fake world isn't the worst thing to live in. I just wish it didn't hurt so damn much. I watched a Star Wars film that doesn't exist. It makes me physically ill seeing the trailers this weekend. Star Wars Episode 9, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. When the hype starts, it skyrockets, and everything in your social media feed becomes Star Wars this and Star Wars that. Believe me, when I was a kid, this would have felt like Christmas to me. I grew up on Star Wars. I saw the second film, The Empire Strikes Back, in theaters with my dad, and made one of the greatest memories of my life. God rest his soul. For my birthdays, I would ask for Star Wars toys. As a teenager, when I got the Nintendo 64, I played Shadows of the Empire nonstop, despite being extremely bad at the game. It was my favorite franchise above all others. I was spurred on by my father, who actually worked as a merchandising consultant with Lucasfilms. He would even later be hired onto the Lucasfilm studio until his passing in 1988. I always found it weird back then. He used to talk about Star Wars all the time with me, often bringing home extra toys that he'd get from meetings and seminars. But the day after he was hired directly by the studio, it all stopped. I figured that now that he was part of the actual team, he just wasn't allowed to talk about the movies, like some sort of non-disclosure kind of thing. 
but that didn't really explain his demeanor, which slowly declined until he passed away. God, it makes my eyes water thinking about it. Well, in the summer of 1998, I had just graduated college, and I was desperately trying to get interviews for a job. After my fourth rejection call that week, I was more than distraught. I drank a lot that night. I borrowed some booze from my mother. I downed my favorite whiskey, the same kind my dad used to indulge in on the weekends. Now, I didn't get blackout drunk, but I came quite close to it. Close enough that I didn't remember much of the night before when I woke up in my bed in the morning. But apparently, I had been very busy before daylight. My room was absolutely thrashed. Collectibles had been torn open and tossed onto the floor. There was a hole in my door, and there was spilled alcohol all over my desk. But something else caught my eye. I had apparently pried up some of the hardwood floor. Rather than that part of the floor looking like it had been destroyed, it rather appeared to come away perfectly, like a puzzle piece. If I had to guess, it appeared that I had punched the floor in that spot, only to discover that the floor was false. What the hell, I thought to myself. We'd lived in this house ever since my dad was promoted back then. It's been several years, and I had never noticed this secret hole before. But maybe it hadn't been here that whole time, I wondered. Groggily, I tried to pick myself up from the bed, but I quickly felt vomit rising in my throat instead. I ran to the bathroom, relieving my sour stomach and washing myself up. I felt a bit better after that. As I exited the bathroom, I peered down the hallway to my mom's room. I could see that she was still asleep. Ever since dad passed, she worked nonstop, fighting tooth and nail to keep the house despite the expensive payments. I sighed, grabbed a quick glass of water, then went back to my room, making sure that the door was shut. I turned the ceiling fan light on, then knelt in the floor. I pulled up the false wooden plank. I hovered my head over the hole and looked inside. There, I found a small rectangular black box. Being human, of course my interest was piqued. I practically yanked the thing out and began to open it. Inside, there was a protective layer of velvet at the top that I pulled out, and underneath that was a folded up slip of paper that looked like it might crumble if I picked it up too quickly. Slowly, I used my thumb and index finger to lift it out of place. Then I laid it on my desk. Carefully, I unfolded it. Written in plain black Sharpie was a message. This wasn't meant for you, son. I'm sorry that you found this. My heart seemed to stop in that moment. I recognized my dad's handwriting quite clearly. My mouth went dry, and my breathing sped up. I desperately flipped over the note to see if there was more. This was a secret message from my father to me. Surely there had to be more to it. But there wasn't. Just an odd apology. Grinding my teeth, I was a little bit angry. I hadn't heard from him in years, and I would never see him again. Yet, this was all his little secret note said. I shook my head and went back to the box. There had been one more thing within it, a rectangular object wrapped in an old rag. Slowly, I unwrapped it. Inside was a VHS tape, one that did not have any label or any brand name for that matter. Excitedly, I turned on my VCR clicked on the TV, praying that the sound was low enough that the static and white noise wouldn't wake up my mother. Then I inserted the tape. It's hard to describe what I felt finding this strange tape alongside what was now my father's new last words. There was a joyful anxiety, but also a deep twist in my stomach. The blue screen appeared on the TV with a timestamp at the top right. After a few moments, the VCR displayed a big play sign at the top left. 
Then the video began to play. First, there was a black screen with a simple white text overlay at the bottom left that read, Star Wars Project Saber. My mouth hung open. This wasn't real, right? The overlay then changed after about 10 seconds as the scene faded into view of space. It now read, Death Star, Intensity Variation Number 337. My mind was reeling. Star Wars was getting a prequel at the time, and my first thoughts on this was that my dad had hidden away footage of an old spin-off film, or perhaps another sequel that had been scrapped back in the day. I was beyond ecstatic at this, a lost sequel to my favorite film series. I was overcome with anticipation then. I would be only one of very few people who would see this. This was a gift from my dad, I thought. He wanted me to see this. I watched, leaning forward closer, as if I wanted the TV set to absorb me into it. The camera panned from a very realistic view of a star. As it turned, eventually a planet was revealed. A planet that was very obviously the Earth. I cocked my head to the side with confusion. We had never seen Earth in the Star Wars movies. As the intro roll sequence always stated, Star Wars took place in a galaxy far, far away. I kept watching, and I noticed that the camera's movement was extremely stiff. Perhaps this shot was scrapped because it was so badly made. Suddenly, the entire screen was covered in a bright yellow, almost white flash. It was so bright it hurt, forcing me to wince. The hangover didn't help at all. I covered my eyes and waited for the brightness to fade. After about three seconds, it did. What the hell was that, I wondered, rewinding the tape a bit to see what exactly happened. I grabbed the TV remote as well to turn down the brightness. Another blow to my bloodshot eyes like that and I'd probably black out right there. I pressed play and watched closely. The screen went bright, but I was now able to see something that I did not see before. There was a cylindrical arc of light. It was so fast that it appeared into existence immediately, stretching all the way down to the earth itself. Jesus Christ, I muttered. These effects were astounding. Even as a kid, I could see how poor some of the CGI and lighting effects were in Star Wars. But this, I couldn't be sure that they weren't real. And then I saw where the arc extended to, smack dab in the center of what appeared to be Russia. The beam then disappeared instantly. Before I could understand what I just watched, the scene cut to black and another overlay appeared. Reading, Saber, Forceful Candidate, Trial Part, Number 97. I repositioned myself and eagerly awaited to see what would come next. The scene faded into what appeared to be a small, smooth metal room. The camera was located directly in front of a strange chair or throne with a weird structure hanging just above it. The structure was a mess of wires and metallic appendages, the largest of which were two claws that ended in odd-looking mirrors on either side. It took about a minute for anything to happen, but when it did, I was dumbfounded. In walked two large uniformed soldiers, dragging a half-conscious man toward the throne. The man wasn't wearing any clothes, and the officer's uniforms were modern, not at all futuristic. At this point, I was certain that this wasn't an actual Star Wars film, or a theatrical film at all. They strapped the man to the chair as a voice was heard from behind the camera. Why is he awake? He's not supposed to be awake for this. One of the soldiers looked up at the person talking and shrugged with a smile, replying, It's a little late for that now. There was an exasperated sigh from behind the camera before the soldiers exited the room. The man strapped into the chair was beginning to moan becoming more lucid by the second. Then the mechanism above began to move. The mirrored claws came down on either side of him, 
and began to float about a foot away from his body. There was an audible clack from behind the camera, followed by a sound like a generator starting up. The screen went nearly white for a few seconds before the camera focused again. Glowing in front of the man between the mirrored claws of the mechanism was a two inch thick solid beam of light or energy. The man now wide awake was screaming, tugging at his restraints, but they did not budge. The mechanism floated to the right, then began to lower over what would be his left wrist. When it made contact, there was a loud, sickening hissing sound. The man cried out louder than before. The fingers on his left hand twitched and jolted and reached out desperately until they stopped. The hand had been separated completely at the wrist from the beam. Well done. A new voice came from behind the camera, followed by a familiar one. Amazing. My mouth was wide open. I hadn't blinked in what felt like ages. This was wrong. Why would my father hide a tape like this in my room? Was this some sort of artistic horror film? A body horror sci-fi movie? Or was it real? Because it definitely looked like it. Suddenly, there were more clacks behind the camera. The mechanism moved and widened itself so that the beam stood perpendicular to the man's torso. That's when the beam began to move toward him. The closer it got to his chest, the louder he cried, the more he screamed, and I realized that I had been screaming too. I quickly reached for the VCR, cutting off the power and yanking the tape out. I ran to the door and looked down the hallway. My mother was, thankfully, still asleep. Then I looked at the tape in my hand. I began to wonder why my dad had this and what it had to do with him. I remembered then hearing dad talk about a different kind of Star Wars a long time ago. Back in 1983, I think, before I could remember, President Reagan had announced a new defense initiative he dubbed Star Wars. Of course, this idea was often ridiculed. A waste of taxpayers' dollars, they said. Defense systems in space were too far out. Pure fantasy, they said. But what I saw on that tape was very real. The following day, when my mother wasn't home, I dug through my dad's old stuff. There were old papers and documents from Lucasfilms, some name tags, his old suits, but nothing out of the ordinary. I went back to the false floor and pried it open, scanning it thoroughly to make sure there wasn't something there. When I found nothing, I fell onto my bed and wondered. Then it hit me. I began to scour every inch of the floors in the house. If my dad was hiding something as insane as that tape, then there must be something else hidden in this place. And bingo. Under my parents' bed on my mother's side, was another false floor. I was trembling, nervous as I tore it open. Inside, I found a briefcase. I pulled it out and laid it on the floor, undoing the latches and opening it. My eyes flew open. There must have been several thousand dollars there. I'd never seen so much money in one place. Then I saw the note taped to the upper part of the briefcase. Cautiously, I peeled the tape off and pulled the note closer to myself. It read, My dear, I hope you find this when you need it. My dealings with the government have seen me gone from home too often. I miss you both beyond belief. Please see the attached document below these bills. Retain them until it is possible to give them to Andrian. Keep safe. If this document is recovered by them, I fear for our lives. The moment I finished reading it, I pulled the cash up from the briefcase and searched for the aforementioned document. It didn't take long to find a manila envelope, and inside was a typewritten file. The top revealed everything that I was horrified to see. Lucasfilms X Project Saber, Star Wars Initiative. I was hesitant to read the rest of it, this was as deep as rabbit holes went, but it was too late now. 
too late to put it all back and pretend it never happened. The document went on to detail a collaboration behind the minds of Lucas Films and government researchers to quote unquote, visualize new defense weapons. Defense weapons. What is defensive about burning an imprisoned man in half with a beam of pure light? I quickly hid everything back under the floorboard, all except for the cash, of course. Later that night, I gave the cash to my mother. She asked where I'd gotten it all. I simply replied that I had gotten very lucky with the scratch-off. Very lucky, huh? She said. She was suspicious at first, but too thrilled to question it. As for me, I haven't stopped questioning it. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that my father's death was no accident. It wasn't random. I was told that it was a heart attack, but that is BS. Considering the notes, he didn't know that he was going to die, but he did know his life would be in danger if they knew. But why did he place anything in my room? Unless he wanted me to be a part of it one day. My father was in deep here, and I know that the rabbit hole goes deeper. But if I dig any more, they might come after me and my mother. I barely remember much of my time spent in kindergarten, but certain traumatic experiences could make any memory vivid for the rest of your days. Author Andrew from the No Sleep subreddit shares a childhood experience he cannot forget. One of my kindergarten friends never came back from the woods. So, in kindergarten, I had three best friends. There was Jesse, Miranda, and then there was Jocelyn. Jocelyn was different than the rest of us. When she got angry, she had to be taken out of the classroom and brought to a special room, just for kids like her. This really confused me at the time, because I was only five or six and I didn't know anything but terrible reasoning. My terrible reasoning came into play when all of the group were hanging out at my house in my backyard. See, my yard had a wooden fence, but behind that wooden fence was a wide, vast forest with this huge river system and a few large drops. I loved going back there on the rare occasions I didn't wuss out. This happened to be one of those rare occasions. We all snuck out of the fence and crawled on our knees into the forest. We could see green and brown and sunny blues. It was amazing. So we continued on, spotting a few animals and such. And then we encountered a drop. Jesse and Miranda were both excited, looking down the big drop and questioning what was down there. I determined the only way to know was to go down there. After 10 minutes and little hands grabbing rocks and climbing down unsteadily, we made it. The area we were in was abnormal. There weren't a lot of trees or rocks anymore, just dirt and grass and empty logs. Jocelyn started acting weird when we got to the middle of the new area. She was twitchy like she was when she needed her special pills or her sleeping syrup stuff. I asked her if she was okay, and she just nodded. After walking for forever, at least two little kids, we saw something even weirder than anything we had seen. A deer carcass was strung up by the neck, and it was clearly not fresh by the flies buzzing around its empty eye sockets and the chunk of flesh taken from the side of it. Jocelyn didn't like this. She was shaky, 
really shaky, and her eyes were wide. She looked like she was going to scream. So I patted her back, and I told her it was fine. It was gone now and couldn't hurt us. But she got shakier. She was whispering about how it wasn't that thing that was going to hurt us, that something had to have done that to the deer. But she was saying it in simpler, little kid words. We walked on. Miranda found mushrooms, and Jesse ate a ladybug and some moss because he was hungry. Regular kindergartner stuff. But Jocelyn was getting worse the closer we got to wherever we were heading. She was practically unable to move from all her shaking, but I chose to ignore it and walked on. The last weird thing we saw that day before returning was a single hand nailed to a tree. Of course, we were terrified of it, being five and six-year-olds. We ran, we ran far away, climbed up, went home, and we were all aware, even Jocelyn, that we had to forget this happened. However, the next week at around 11 p.m., something outside woke me up. I peered out of my window and saw a small, childlike figure crouching and waddling into the woods, leaving the gate wide open. I didn't understand the importance of this, so I fell back to sleep. The next day, Jocelyn wasn't at school. She wasn't there the day after either, or the next week, or the next. And eventually, the teacher called the class to the front and told us that Jocelyn had gone missing, and if anyone at all had seen her in the last three weeks, to say so immediately where and when. But nobody answered, not even me, who technically had seen her the night she'd gone missing, but didn't even know. Over the course of five months, police went searching far and wide for Jocelyn, but they never found her, until they questioned me of anywhere she could have been. I told them we had gone into the woods and found a drop once. This got them into the woods with me fast. We found our drop, but they left me at home while they went down. And when they came back, they didn't tell me why they were so quiet. I never really knew what happened to her until recently. I had been reading through old newspaper articles and ended up finding a three-page story on the investigation behind Jocelyn Harps and what had happened. Reading through it was the worst part. No, scratch that. Looking at the images was the worst. It described how I helped them discover her body. It was strung up by her neck. She had all her appendages removed, and her eyes had been gouged out. Like the deer, she had a chunk, a large, fat chunk, carved out of her side. The next newspaper had an article about the body of a man found in an old rotting wood shack near the area they found the body of Jocelyn. The man's mouth and teeth were stained red, crimson, but that fluid clearly wasn't his, because he had perished of natural causes, and nothing could have led to him vomiting blood or something. So they sent samples to the lab. The tests concluded the blood belonged to the now deceased Jocelyn Harps, they found her eyes and appendages nailed to trees surrounding the shack, each covered with plastic wrap, as if someone had done an attempt at preserving them. So we know Jocelyn Harps never came out of the woods. At least, that's all we know. When 
I look back on what I saw back there in that small town, all I feel is numb. What else can you feel in the face of such horror? The case I'm about to present before you is disturbing. It is not a pleasant story, and certainly not for those with a weak heart or stomach. But it's a story that needs to be told. It all began in the woods surrounding a small town about a month ago. It was in these woods the first victim was found, a man by the name of Tom Grady. His body was found without clothes, and his face had been taken off. The police's main suspicions were on a crazy, substance-fueled psycho of some sort, or maybe just a regular, substance-induced run through the woods without clothes, ending in a meeting with a vicious bear. It was extraordinary, but simple when you looked at it. That was until they checked his stomach contents. The coroner, a solid man by any standard, had to get out of the room to vomit into a trash can. They found Tom Grady's face in his stomach. The main theory shifted again. The man was on some sort of substance, crazy beyond control, and did what people do in those situations. That one lasted as long as a month before the forensic report came back, because the man was as clean as a teddy bear. So perhaps Tom Grady was just crazy then, because it couldn't be anything else. But then it happened again, two bodies together in the woods, a man and a woman, no clothes, their faces skinned. At least this time the coroner didn't vomit when he pulled out their half-digested faces from their digestive tracts nor were there any theories for the negative test results to dash, only blind confusion. It happened again, though, this time a kid 15, also not wearing clothes and found in the woods, and again, even younger, 13. And it kept on happening every couple of days, a new victim in the woods, a figure started forming when the local newspaper printed the first sighting of the skin man. An old photo, black and white, with just one small caption, taken in the woods. It was poorly lit, showing a figure among the trees. At first glance, he appeared to be without clothes as well. His head was blank. But then, as your eyes adjusted, you could see it clearer. From neck down, his whole body's skin was face after face, all stitched together to form a humanoid clothing. From this, a legend began to grow. The skin man was a demonic spirit that lived in the woods, that lured people into the woods, and made them skin themselves. The whole thing was horrific, nasty, and none of my business. I wouldn't have bothered with these urban legends and skinnings at all, at least until I got a phone call from an old college friend, John. The skin man had taken his eight-year-old son. I was on the extremely shady side of the P.I. business. None of my friends ever wanted me to work for them, even if I offered, so I knew he was calling me out of sheer desperation. I arrived in town the day after. His household had held up incredibly well after the passing. His wife sought comfort from a support group on social media, Tom Grady had been an active member of that group, so the whole community was mourning together. John had a friend on the police force. 
the coroner who performed the autopsy. He was how I got the vomit story. Great guy. Together, the coroner and I made a promise to John. I would do anything and everything in my power to find out what was happening, legal or not. The coroner would try as much as he could to point his colleagues in the direction I'd give them. Then we swore an oath in his son's bedroom. It took me about three months to scrounge everything I needed. At the end of it, I called John and his police friend over. I was surprised to see the coroner arrive first, while John was late by an entire hour. Sorry I was late. I was with my wife trying to find her phone. She lost it, so I waved it by. We'll talk about it later, I said. I solved this. I motioned them to follow me. I led them to my living room where I had set up my projector. I want you to know one thing. None of this is legally enforceable in a court. The only thing you'll get out of watching this is that you'll know now what exactly is happening in this town. I saw no rejection in their eyes, only grim acceptance. So I turned on the projector. On the screen, there was shown a young girl in a bedroom lying on a bed. The lights were off and the only illumination came from a window peering outside. John twitched. That's my neighbor's daughter. Yes, I stole this tape from her parents. He had a disgusted look on his face and moved as if to block the projector but I pointed to the screen. Look at that window. The light from her window came from another window. It was coming from a lamp shining in someone's bedroom. John stepped back as recognition clicked in his head. It was his son's bedroom, the very night he had disappeared. He was right there, lying in his bed, through the girl's window, we could see everything. For a few minutes, we sat together in silence, watching the child as the moment of reckoning drew near. Then we heard a loud screeching noise. It was hard to make out what it was due to heavy distortion. For a few seconds afterward, nothing happened. Then, the bedroom door lock turned and opened revealing a silhouette of a humanoid figure standing in the hallway. It marched forward to his son's bed, hands reaching for him. It crossed over the lamplight, and I heard a gasp from beside me as the face of John's wife emerged from the darkness. As we watched, she grabbed her son's shoulders and shook him awake. She whispered something into his ear, and took him in her arms. As she carried him down the stairs, the screeching noise started again, still distorted, but now clear enough to be identified as the sound of a car revving up. I paused the tape. John was frozen, just staring blankly at the screen. Good. Frozen was how I needed him. Otherwise, he might have punched me for what I did next. I took out a phone, John's wife's phone. I told you I was shady. As I punched in her password and accessed her group on social media, I pulled up her messages, then connected it to the projector and cast it on the screen. And then the real story started. The story of a cancer that had been growing in this closed town. The cancer that had hid under the skin of a support group. The chat showed the slow degradation of the group into a cult. Not a cult. A cult takes passion. What these people had was intense apathy to human life. Originally, the purpose of the parent support group had been to be just that, a place for parents to vent and be comforted. 
Over the course of several months, the support had been becoming more and more derailed. More posts started showing up about how ungrateful their kids were, how much of their lives the parents had to give up to raise them, how the kids were forming gangs. They couldn't have raised such brats, could they? Slowly, a growing belief was starting to spread among the members that their children were cursed, born evil. It was then that the Skin Man was really born. It was Sean Theron who dug up the old tale. The Skin Man was an ominous figure from an old wives' tale, a dark influencer who wanted discord and whispered dark things to children, corrupts them until their souls ran black, and then led them to skin their parents alive. Maybe it was supposed to be a joke at first. Oh, the skin man. He was the real reason the town's kids were so rotten. Oh, the skin man. What other sensible reason was there? None. It was the only reasonable explanation. People began talking about how they often thought their children would spend too much time talking to themselves in their rooms how they thought they may have heard someone talking back, how the children seemed awfully fond of the woods. And then one day, it stopped being a joke anymore. A tale from the city came of a boy who'd taken his father's life. The group was aflame. How could they stand by and watch this dark figure destroy their world? How could no one else do anything when the evidence was so strong? When it was all so obvious, the skin man was doing it. They had to do something, and it had to be outside of the system, because the skin man might have gotten to everyone else. Tom Grady, an ardent supporter of the original purpose of the group, was going to shut the whole thing down. He offered a desperate plea to the mob, asking them to come to their senses. But that did not go down well with them. After all, if you couldn't see that skin man had to be stopped, you were either getting in the way, or worse, actively supporting him. Once again, it was Sean Theron who started it. He privately messaged to everyone in the group, begging them to take action against this dark figure that was ruining their lives. Tom was practically a follower of the skin man by opposing the group. It was kill or be killed. So they grabbed him. He was their first victim, their experiment to finalize their method. But the stomach... Once you dismiss the impossible, only the possible, no matter how horrific it may be, remains. Tom was force-fed his own skin. The group was ecstatic. Celebration all around. True justice. Justice the system wouldn't understand. Victory against the skin man. And John's wife sent more than a few flirty messages to the hero, Sean. From there, the horrific crusade continued. Parents were given the duty of purifying their children. And so they did. Their children weren't really their children. They were demons sent by that cursed figure. Demons that had eaten their real children and would soon come to torture them. It was self-defense against a greater evil. Vengeance against the skin man. And that was that. John had dropped to the floor now, kneeling, his eyes still staring away at nothing. We helped him to his feet and accompanied him to his home. That's where we left him, sitting in silence in his living room. From that day on, the very structure of the investigation changed. Instead of searching for a single suspect, the focus turned on the parents. The results came rushing in. 
dozens arrested in the first week. John's wife was one of the first. It should have been the biggest story of our time, but it isn't. The story hasn't spread at all. Sean Theron was the editor of the newspaper. There was absolutely nothing found against him, not even on the Grady case. I don't know how that guy was so freaking clean, but he's still free now. Free to run his pen all over the morning news. All the people of this lonely little town know is that the skeptics and the pig-headed police were just arresting ordinary people for the crimes of the dreaded skin man. His daughter hasn't disappeared yet. Despite my very presence there putting me at risk, I managed to get a message through to his wife. Recently, the newspapers have turned against her calling her a liar. I hope to God she gets custody. A heavy fear hangs on me that I won't be able to enter that town again. John's been at the police station protesting day and night for his wife's innocence. He's talking about possession and shape-shifting. He still believes in the skin man. Recently, not one hour ago, I got a text from my police friend. It was about John's wife. She's now saying that the skin man made her do it. I just got a private message from, well, someone important. It read, This is all exaggeration. You just take the facts and twist them. I've already contacted the mods here. You're hurting other people. Your skepticism is helping the skin man grow. I've seen the skin man in my dreams. I've seen him dance in the woods with his demon children, singing the black songs. The story you're about to hear is disturbing. Author Nick Rachel from Reddit's No Sleep Forum shares a story with us that will make your stomach turn and your spine freeze solid. You see, prison is a terrifying place as we all know, but the things that often happen inside that we don't know about are the most horrific of all. One man's father is an ex-convict who is ready to share his stories from his time behind bars. These are Tales from an Ex-Convict. My father spent 14 years locked behind the thick steel doors of the Barry Telford State Penitentiary, located right outside Texarkana, Texas. Recently, I took an interest in the darker events that have happened to various family members and sat down to ask him if he had any chilling stories or experiences he could share about his time he spent incarcerated, anything that he hadn't shared with me before. I was both pleased and horrified, as for the next two hours, he divulged some truly chilling and grotesque tales. I will just let you know now that some of these stories are graphic, and if you have a weak stomach, I'd advise you not to read further. For the rest of you, I won't sparse details, and I'll lay them out exactly as he laid them out to me. My father was sent to the Telford unit a few months after his 21st birthday, sentenced to 20 years for armed robbery. It is a maximum security prison designed to mostly hold suspected gang members and violent criminals. The first day is a total shock to your system. You're stripped and cavity searched coming in and out of every room. You've got a bedtime, you're timed at meals and thrown into a cell with three other inmates telling you the house rules and which bunk is yours. Then laying in bed that first night, that's when it hits you that this is home now 
that this is your life now. Out of anything I can recall, that feeling of helplessness and hopelessness, that loss of freedom, that's the scariest part of prison, he said. He told me as the months passed, you get used to your routine. You start to need the structure, even crave it. He said he decided to make the best of it, learn as many skills as he could, and stay as busy as possible. One of his vocational skills he picked up was plumbing and soon became the in-house plumber for A building. Now the way the prison is set up is that there is an A building and a B building. Inside of each building, there are 10 cell houses. Each cell house contains 12 cells that can hold anywhere from one to four inmates each. In the middle of each cell house is the rec room where the cells all open up and this is where the inmates spend most of their free time. In addition to the cell houses, each building also contains several solitary wings labeled from A seg to Z seg. When I first got there, everyone kept joking that if I stepped out of line, the guards would send me to M seg. One day I asked a buddy who had been locked up for 15 years already when I got there why people kept talking about M seg and not any of the other sag wings. Look, his buddy told him. People who have extended stays in M just don't come back the same. Some don't come back at all. The guards know it. That's why they always fill M last, or put new guys there who think they might be troublemakers. And not in M, and you'll straighten your act up real quick. I've never been there myself, but I talked to a couple inmates who have, and they both told me the same thing. Something evil lives in that place. So like I said, my dad had become the on-call plumber for A building. He said it was about six months into the job when he had his first encounter with M Seg. It's a real mess down there. I've seen a lot of crap in my day, but this is crazy. The guard told my dad as he led him down the connecting corridors. Just make sure you wear your gloves and booties, Rachel. My dad was curious and asked the guard what had happened. A looney tune on suicide watch. I guess somehow must have snuck in a piece of metal. Look, I shouldn't tell you this, but I don't want you to be surprised when you get in there. C Crazy cut off his own, well, downstair area. Threw his giblets out on the run. But we can't find his, uh, shaft. And that's where you come in. When they reached their destination, there was another guard standing outside with an inmate holding a mop, waiting to clean up after my dad was finished. My dad said they opened the door to Imseg, and it was almost hauntingly dark. Four or five dim overhead lights ran down the hallway, but seemed to act more like spotlights and gave off practically no ambient light. He said there was a trail of red leading toward the back of the corridor. Each seg block had 14 cells with solid steel doors, and each door had a small window that could be opened and closed from the outside, and a tray slit, which the guy used to toss his balls out. As he got closer, he could see that the red was running out from a cell toward the end of the block through a small gap under the door. Open 13, the guard yelled to another guard behind a glass window, controlling the electronic locks. When I went into that cell, I couldn't believe how much blood there was. It was on the walls and on the ceiling. The entire mattress pad was doused in it. The toilet was flooded up to the brim, and it looked like it was filled with red. I used a cup to transfer the red water into buckets until I could start to see the silhouette of something under the water. I could see a big wad of toilet paper, so I pulled it out and I set it on the floor. I could tell something was inside it. As I started to slowly unravel the wad, all of a sudden I started hearing this noise coming from the air vents. Tunk, tunk, tunk it sounded like. It was like someone was crawling or trying to sneak through them almost. I didn't think much of it at the time, but I'll get back to that later. Anyway, I unrolled the paper and sure enough, the guy's pecker was right there. 
The guard took it and dropped it in a bag of ice, and after making sure the toilet flushed, he started leading my dad back to the entrance of MSEG. When we got down that hall waiting for the exit door to open, all the lights went out. The hell? muttered the guard. Against the wall, inmate. I stood back against the wall, my dad continued. And as the guards tried to figure out what was going on, I heard that noise in the vents again. It was coming from the cell I'd just come out of. Tunk, tunk, tunk it went. I didn't know what it was, but it gave me the most awful feeling. And as I was standing there, I realized it was getting louder and faster and closer to me. Tunk, 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 tunk. It sounded like whatever was in that vent was now in a full sprint right at us. The guard was trying to ignore it, but I could tell he heard it too, because he kept looking back over his shoulder and started yelling at the guard behind the glass. Hey, hey, tunk, tunk, tunk. Hurry, get this freaking door open. Tunk, tunk, tunk. Just as the noise in the vent got up to us, the lights came back on and it went silent. The door opened up and the guard got us out of there as fast as he could. A few days later, I saw the inmate who was waiting on janitor duty that night and asked him if he had seen anything. He told me he saw them wheel a guy covered in crimson fluids out on a stretcher and that he was screaming about a man in the vents and that the man had told him to do it. My dad also asked if he had heard anything in the vents while he was mopping up, but he told my dad he didn't hear anything, but he did find the metal the man from 13 had used on himself. It was buried in a pool of blood, the guy said. Damnedest thing, too. Looked like a piece of shrapnel cut out from air duct metal. The next story my dad shared with me is even more graphic and scary in the sense of what human beings are capable of. We get new guys that think they're going to be badasses all the time. Sometimes it works out for them, and other times it don't. There were lots of serious gangs in BTU, and sometimes you get a guy who comes in from a local street gang that doesn't really comprehend how violent some of these big gangs are. It's like they're playing gang to look cool. My kids play cops and robbers, Problem is that they think other people are just playing gang two or something, but they're not. Anyway, we had this one guy, Ricky, come in, and everyone but him knew it was gonna end badly for him. He was this young Hispanic guy, and he thought his small town gang was a direct rival to another Hispanic gang, MS-13. He would curse out and disrespect them in front of everyone at chow time, and in the halls, and scream at their members who pass his cell. He'd only been there a week. Some of the elders tried telling him he needed to calm down before he got hurt, but Ricky was hard-headed and just wouldn't hear it. Well, one day during dinner, the chow hall was quiet, and Ricky was nowhere to be seen. My table was dismissed first, and as we made our way back to our cell house, we turned the corner to see Ricky there, covered in red, stumbling towards us, arms wrapped around his stomach. He was completely naked, big patches of his skin cut from his body where his tattoos had been. Both his eyes were popped out, just dangling toward the ground. The side of his head was caved in where they had stomped on it. As he came closer, I could see he was holding his innards in his hands. The worst part to me is that he hadn't died during it, that he was conscious for every blow and every cut. He just hobbled up the hall in our directions, crying and asking, why can't I look up? Why can't I look up? He collapsed and passed out a few seconds later, then passed away right there at our feet. We never found who did it. All right, I'll share one more story my dad shared with me. I found kind of creepy, as this is getting pretty long. About seven years ago into his stint in prison, 
my dad said through a series of circumstances he ended up having to stay the night in MSEG. The A building was being renovated and repaired, and as a result, they were sending the inmates to stay in SAG in waves. Well, it had been years since my dad had been to the rarely used MSEG, and he had convinced himself that he was just hearing things that night. They were leading prisoners out one cell at a time and transferring them to the various SEG blocks. My dad's cell was on the end, and he had his cell to himself, so when they transferred him, he wasn't accompanied by any other inmates. To his dismay, all the SEG blocks had been filled, except for M, that is. They led him down to the end of M and opened the door to 14, which was right next to the cell the man had hurt himself in all those years ago. Everything was fine until lights out. It was really dark in there. Each cell had a little nightlight thing above the toilet, but it's not enough to see anything, let alone read or write. Anyway, it was so dark, I figured the only thing I could do was go to sleep. But all night I kept hearing the guy in the cell next to me talking to himself. The way the cells are set up, the vents carry any little noise to the adjoining cells. The vents themselves are located right at the foot of the little cots in each cell. People would sit next to them to communicate and pass time during stints in solitary. But this guy wasn't talking to me. It was like he was talking to himself, and it was really starting to wear on my nerves. I banged on the vent and told him to keep it down, but he just kept talking in this whispery voice. But it sounded like he was chanting the same thing over and over. I couldn't make out what he was saying. I put my ear up to the vent to try and see what he was saying, and my hair stood up on the back of my head when I swear to God, I felt his breath in my ear as clear as day. I heard him whispering, I remember you. I remember you. I remember you. Well, you won't remember nothing when I bash your head in if you don't keep it down in there, I told him. All of a sudden, his voice got a little louder and angrier in tone. I'll slit your throat. I'll slit your throat. I'll slit your throat. I was a little unnerved, but I've heard a lot worse after so many years in prison, so I just told him to screw off and decided I'd let the guards deal with it in the morning. Well, morning came, and when the guard brought me my breakfast, I told him if he didn't do something about that guy keeping me up all night and 13, that I would do something about it. What are you talking about, Rachel? You're the only person in MSEG. The guard told me as chills ran down my spine. That night, as soon as the light went out, the whispering started again, and this time I was petrified. I'll slit your throat. I'll slit your throat. I'll slit your throat. The whispers were more aggressive this time, clearer too. Then all of a sudden, it went from whispering to deep guttural screams. I'll slit your throat. I'll slit your throat. I'll slit your throat. It scared me so bad I fell out of my cart and scooted on the floor until I felt my back hit the wall opposing the air vent. As my eyes came into focus in absolute horror, I saw the silhouette of a head directly inside the vent. I couldn't make out its features, but I saw its eyes. They were full of hatred and rage, and they were locked right into me. Fast and louder, he just continued screaming that he'd slit my throat as the vent casing started to shake. Now the vents go straight up into a duct, to a main duct, then back down to the next cell through another duct, so you can't see into your neighbor's cell from your cell. That meant whatever this thing was, it was right inside my vent. I jumped up and banged on the steel door as hard as I could, telling for a guard. Someone, help me! The guard came running down the hall, and as soon as he slid the door window open, the vent went silent. You gotta get me out of here. Something's in those vents. 
I pleaded. To my surprise, the guard didn't protest my request. Instead, he just told me to hang tight for a second, then clicked his radio and said, Need an open cell for a transfer from MSEG. He paused for a second, then leaned back into his radio and simply said, "Uh, He's back. He opened the door and led me down the corridor, and as they did the whole time, we were followed by that familiar sound in the vents. Tunk, tunk, tunk. I've seen and heard a lot in my years. Not a lot gets under my skin, but I was shaking like a leaf the whole way out of MSEG. I don't think I took a breath until I walked out the blocked doors and heard them shut behind me. I finally worked up the nerve to ask the guard what the hell was in those vents. I don't know, Rachel. Warden will tell you there's nothing in those vents, but all I can tell you is that whatever it is, it's evil. My dad told me some interesting rumors and theories about who the man in the vent might have been, and even a theory as to why the guard had said he's back, tales of a failed exorcism and a cover-up by the warden, as well as a few more spooky stories both related to and not related to MSEG that some fellow inmates had shared with them. If you want to hear any more, my dad has plenty more stories from his time as a convict. Have you ever had a nightmare so scary, you woke up screaming, sweating, heart pounding painfully in your chest? I have, and it's one of the worst feelings in the world. Luckily, it only takes seconds to realize it was nothing more than a dream, but you still find yourself praying that it was just a dream. Author Mick Junker from Reddit's Short Scary Stories Forum shares his story of the most bizarre and haunting nightmare they've ever had. A nightmare of the gangly man. I woke up with a jolt in bed, soaked in sweat and ready to scream. I was breathing hard and clenching bed sheets in my fists. I slowly eased back into my pillow and tried to calm myself down. I focused on the nightmare, trying to remember before it slipped away. I had been walking the streets at night, coming home from work. I heard footsteps behind me and I turned and looked. It was a tall man with long, gangly arms and stringy hair down to his shoulders. He was following me, step for step. As our eyes locked, he nodded at me and held up a forefinger. He mouthed one word, one. I turned and kept walking. Every time I turned around, the gangly man changed a detail, adding something to his appearance. First, his face became plastered in white paint. Next, his nose grew red and bulbous. Further glances gave him enormous blue shoes, turned his stringy hair bright orange, and changed his neat dark clothes into something tattered and festive. I knew by dream logic that once his transformation was complete, the gangly man would be there at my shoulder, happy and jolly and starving for meat. I knew it. I tried to not look back anymore and hurry away from him, but dream physics slowed my power walk to a creep. I heard the slap, slap, slap of gigantic shoes impacting close behind me and the fear seized me. I looked behind me at last. The gangly clown had lost his eyes and gained a mouth full of dog teeth. The raw, empty sockets blinked rapidly at me as he snapped at my face. 
when the teeth caught my cheek and dug in, that's when I jerked awake. I got out of bed and went to the kitchen for a glass of water. As I drank, I checked the street outside just to pass the time between gulps. <sighs> my fingers lost all strength and the glass smashed into the floor. The gangly man in his human skin was leaning against the lamppost outside my home, our eyes locked. He held up two fingers and mouthed a word. Two. I woke up with a jolt in bed, soaked in sweat, and ready to scream.